It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood when the ALGS is coming to town, and that is certainly what we've got this afternoon. Whether it's evening for you and you're watching in Europe after seeing your teams clash, or maybe you're in North America in the afternoon with a good old Sunday football on the side and ALGS right there with you, this is what you should be watching as we head into North America's final day of the beginning round robin stages of our season. I cannot wait to get into it, and hopefully neither can you. My name is Rain Day. We've got a beautiful day of competition with teams that need to win, want to win, and I think may surprise us in the end. Let's go ahead and introduce our casters along the way for this great day of action. Vicky Kitty coming up as well. I mean, it's been your first broadcast in EMEA back in the season. Off season's over, but now North America, it is time to get going. Finally, we are here. It is time. Enough of the offseason. We are diving into the action that I've been waiting for since Champs, year four of the ALDS. And I'm so happy to be here alongside you, Rain Day. And of course, my partner are coming through, casting the rest of the games with me, Dia. Yes, yes. You got to give love to it, Dia. It's great to have you back. You did both shows yesterday our show earlier today and now to close out a busy weekend for you north america a lot of exciting things happening and i cannot wait for the next six games of action because as we did in emia we're also closing out the second round robin here which means that we will have seen every group play against the others and like we had in emia as well rain day will have a much better idea of who the real top of north america is yeah, you know, last week when I started this show with Dan and uh, Mark, we called this the Great Reset. What did these teams do in the offseason to find a way to be eligible for a chance to win the ultimate prize? At land, that's where these teams often have their sights set. But now, as we've had the first and second going into finishing our third match day, the theme is the end of the beginning. We've kind of seen who has shown up, who has gotten off to the races, who's lagged behind. This is your last chance, if there are question marks about your squad to maybe get the start that you were hoping for to put you in a good position to qualify. And with that, let's take a look at how these teams have performed over the course of the first two days. Vicky, top performing teams. Yesterday, it became clear LG were going to be the leaders, at least as of now, with their masterclass performance. Yeah, I mean, when I got to listen to the comms coming in from Sweet, it's no surprise. And it's huge because I think LG was definitely one of the teams that needed to prove themselves for this first split. There was a lot of question marks whether this team could, I mean, the fact that they have each individual insane players on that roster, but if they were going to be cohesive was a question going into this first year. So now seeing how they've been able to do, they got first with a 20 bomb for game number five yesterday. It was actually bonkers, and I can't wait to see more from that squad. But even going all the way down, Furia, a very KP-heavy team. Moist coming in second just yesterday. This top 10 is heavily stacked after the performance we've seen over the course of these last two days alone. And top 10 does lean a little bit more towards people who've had the chance to play two match days. When we move over to the 11th through 20th places, where we see a lot more people like Disguised, Optic, Phase, Nine Lies, Ape, and Meat Lovers, who all have had only one day of matches in order to move up the leaderboard at all. Now that we'll be rounding those up to two, you can expect a lot of these names to move into the top 10 squads and unseat some of the folks that are currently sitting up there looking high and mighty that haven't really got the gas behind it like these squads do. And when you talk about teams that are in the top 20, that means they're qualified as of now. Everyone who's watched the ALGS before, maybe you need a reminder, I don't know, but I'm gonna assume you remembered go to land in that, in that, and finish in that top 20 playoff opportunity to go to land, excuse me. And that's kind of what you want to make that final match point day of this split. But if you're in the bottom 20 to 30, you have to make a move. Complexity, a team that Wow, can you give it up for Monsoon who gave us that song and also just his presence over at Champs, which was phenomenal, but now wants to get there on his own. A team that has definitely been surprising in the slow start is Xset, but remember, it's because they only have one match day played that they're certainly sitting here. Another three points, that would be shocking to many of the world considering how good they are, how tainted they are. Yes, a lot of expectations for that squad with the helm at, uh, obviously at the helm with their coach Hotsik as well. 
Let's let's really start looking at this, though, in depth on what's happening today, because, yes, some of those teams have already played. They're going to be sitting back and watching, uh, doing some watch parties. B and C, though, they're going in for the action. And Vicky, who stands out to you? I mean, just a quick overview. You got some big names. I'm seeing Disguise, Furia, DZ. I mean, there's a lot of names in B and C. I was honestly really excited for today because there's so many teams I could talk about. Uh, Optic, I want to see them coming out of the gates. Moist, can they continue on that domination after having a little bit, they did well game one, but a little bit falling off going into game two and game three onto Storm Point. But another team that I really want to see perform, Xset. You talk about Koifu. We got to see Exit perform. They had a very rough day yesterday. They got to get that reset going into today. Hopefully, Hotsik was able to sit down with the rest of the squad to talk about what they have to work on here. Dark Zero, the heavy fraggers of this entire lobby, all eyes on them to see if Sykes' inclusion into this roster wasn't a fluke for a first day or, you know, to see if they can mm. keep up that aggression going into today. I mean, we talked about Exet, Koifold, and Sykes leaves that spot. We'll see if they can kind of have some back and forth with DZ. But you had mentioned it, Moist, Gildersons, LG on top. Gildersons no longer with NRG, that whole squad not together and split. And now it's a chance for maybe Moist with Walty and MT moving from APAC South into North America to have a chance. Vicky, is that kind of who you're focusing on to start today? Oh, yeah. I can't wait to see what it's in store for the Moist boys. I know that they're rearing through because that is going to definitely be a team that I have my eyes on as we take a look at Moist and all the highlights that they were able to show us up for yesterday. It was the first day debut, too. So you talk about how some of these teams have already been able to play twice. Well, now this is Moist's turn to really show if they can keep up the consistency. They had a little bit of a rough start on Storm Point, but they were able to come in second place on their day debut, all while getting content tested, by the way, by Legacy. Having an amazing performance on World's Edge where they were basically able to get first with 12 KP. It may have not been the 20 KP gauntlet that we saw from LG, but it was Moist that had to basically rear and actually follow through with a lot of these final circle positionings that we actually currently see right here. This was definitely one of my favorite ones to watch. I was doing a watch party, taking a look at where Moist positioning was. It was TSM that was on the low ground originally, trying to see what they could do with the catwall and move forward, and it was Moist. Haley from above, their only weak position was when they were forced to drop down, and even then, everything was in their favor. MT cleaning up what was left of that final squad, and you could see the progress that they made. Guild with 15 KP, MT, and Walty tying for 10th. But it's also nice to highlight, I remember that former squad of MT, Walty, back when they were the Burger Brigade, all the way now coming <laughs> into North America. It's great to welcome them into North America as a region and to see how well they perform for today. <laughs> Team Burger. They would make me hungry every time we had to talk about them. Dia, though, I know it seemed hungry not just to eat here. I'm, I'm not even sure what their diets are heading into this match day, but I will say they're hungry for recognition. They're hungry for notoriety in the way that, hey, we are a top team. That, of course, is E8. On, on that, very much we can agree. E8, uh, I think in different ways than a lot of squads, have, th have things to prove, but it's less about saying oh, well, we have really good players. People know they have good players. The question is whether they can manage them. With Zach at the helm, the former IGL of C9, the EA squad has actually been around for a while, but they originally, and this may come as a shock, did not have a place in Pro League. They had to play through the preseason qualifiers with Zap and Shuby, and Zap even, a pretty recent entrant into the scene, originally being scouted by Meat Lovers, and then picked up by Zach for his, I'll say, hand-selected roster of E8. They are second to many, at least off of our first day. Third, in fact, in terms of kills and fourth in terms of damage off of match day one. This team flew under a lot of people's radars, and I expect that they won't be silent for too much longer. I don't think so at all. And just to prove you correct, let's go ahead and listen to what Zach had to say about them. What's up, guys? I'm Zach. My teammates are Shubi and Zapto, and our coach is Talmich, and we are Elevate Gaming. Coming from Countdown and Checkpoint, you know, we got the POIs for free, so we're not contested. We got to some really strong early game positions. And, you know, I had the flu and I was having internet issues the entire day. People were talking about me DCing every game, trying to reconnect. And we ended up pulling through. The boys carried me. Those strong power positions and Dark Zero slamming everybody on edge really gave us a big advantage to get that third place on match day one. 
I mean, in my opinion, it feels great to be an underdog. I think it relieves a lot of the pressure. You know, when people expect you to perform and the pressure's on, you know, that can get to anyone. It doesn't matter if you're Hal or Joe Schmo coming out of the POQ, you know. Uh, the pressure the pressure definitely exists. So I appreciate being the underdog. And yes, coming out of the POQ, um, I'm proud that we earned our Pro League spot. Perhaps not having the pressure has given us a few less Mazer moments, but I want the pressure to start amping up a little bit, Rain, because I do like as much as when Zach succeeds, when Zach does something a little silly. <clears throat> I mean, I'm just happy that the phrase Joe Schmo is still, you know, working itself around <laughs> the, the world here, you know, with so many new new phrases coming up every now and then. I, I'm glad to be back in my wheelhouse there. Uh, this time elevates, they're the Joe Schmoes from the PLQ, but... I don't think they're Joe Schmoes anymore in terms of our expectations for them in this lobby. Absolutely had a great start in day one. Let's see if they can continue here in their not only match day three, but their second game, their second day of games. A team that doesn't even need a second day of games to be almost at the top of this entire North American split is none other than Dark Zero, who have showcased not just the only other team besides TSM's capability to win a LAN, but to do it multiple times and now to take on multiple members and do it. Remember, Jen Burton didn't win the first land in Sweden. And when Jen Burton was back, that means it was a different squad uh, to win that first championship. Then you have these opportunities, uh, excuse me, for the split, but you have these opportunities for now Sykes to come in and make a statement for himself that I think he wasn't able to make on Xset. He was phenomenal there. They had a great run, but there was something about that team, the way they were put together, that was dangerous, but not deadly enough to take the win and really go past the Alliance, the, the Xsets, the even NRGs, the Optics at that time, and win. Dark Zero now have proven that with their core, they're able to do it with Jen Burton and Zero. And Sykes might have just pushed them to that next level of being able to compete with TSM when it gets down to it. I'm sure a lot of other teams will show up as a part of our radar, but you gotta say they are looking extremely good overall. This is a cool little graph just showcasing the amount of damage that they've done in the white together. You can put that together kind of roughly, we're in 25, 27,000 damage, whatever it is. But when you compare that to kind of the damage differential that they are leading nearly this entire group with, I'm not sure we'll be able to bring that up right now, but you can see they've got a little over 5,000 damage so doing 27,000 damage they've still taken about 21 but they've done so much more you can tell they're in the middle of fights they're comfortable taking damage they're just that much more confident that they'll be able to dish it out more even if you have a few armor swaps or a couple reses in your back pocket man dark zero what a team what a game what a day we have all of those stories yet to unfold and it all starts with the first game it is the end of the beginning let's see who jumps out to the races officially after six are played but for now let's send it over to your casters to kick off game number one here in north america of our third day of our year four split vicky and dia Thank you so much, Rain Day. I'm here, guys, with Dia, and I'm so excited to take you all through the action. Taking a look at that graph, Dia, another team that really did pop up to me, you know, we highlighted DZ for all the right reasons, but Furia, Dia and Furia, will it happen again? This is a team that is always playing incredibly aggressive, has no issue playing for seconds, but will they become more well-rounded when they know that they have the three-man power to take control over these fights? There are a lot of really cool stories happening with Furia as well. As much as Madness has built, wanted to be at the top of his game as an IGL for a while, he's been on this sort of slow uphill grind over the past couple of years, and now Furia could be the perfect time for that to peak, combining not just his IGL prowess, but also Keon, who had just left Sentinels at the end of last year, perhaps not being a stylistic fit, and now finding himself in a better position with Madness, who they seem to have a lot of we'll say similar reads on the game. Then you've got Watson coming in. Watson, who revolutionized the meta back in 2022 champs. You put all those three pieces together and you have got three very diverse and yet somehow coalescing stories that have come together to create a monstrous team.
It's so many things to look at. I can't wait. And while we get started, guys, game number one, we are moving on to Storm Point for these first three games before we make the transition into World's Edge for our final three games. Teams like Furia that we highlighted actually had a much better time yesterday on Storm Point, getting third back to back versus what their performance was on World's Edge. And then you take a look at teams like LG, a much more well rounded team. They'll be able to benefit off of both of these maps. So it comes down to where these teams team strengths lay and in this first map we get to really tear apart the teams that may be lacking a lot more when it comes to storm point now just yesterday we had dno starting things off strong in some interesting northern zones because we went over to wall and also to the black island just underneath it this time on storm point echo hq was a big focus in our emea rounds and echo hq interestingly enough will be a focus once again but for very different reasons this time with a contest between moist and legacy making its return there that'll be where we're focusing especially in our early game because the poi and those teams can make such a big impact on the game I believe Waltzy actually tweeted it out at the end of the day where he was very happy that they had finished in second place and that's with getting landed on and their loot being uh, basically taken away from them there. So finding your footing on World's Edge after getting landed on by Legacy over by Pulso slash Echo is definitely going to be something I have my eyes on, especially because Legacy themselves were running into some technical difficulties with Nizul's PC. So going into a new day today, hopefully both teams here could iron out whatever they didn't like on Storm Point going into this first game. I know that we're talking about Legacy, but you've just reminded me of Elevate as well. That's the other buff that they have coming into today is a lack, hopefully, fingers crossed, of technical <laughs> issues because last time they were abundant specifically for E8. Hopefully that's been sorted out on their side and we get the opportunity to see them play perhaps a more full day, especially when they already had such a good one in our first map round. Just as the dropship finishes flying through, we should have everybody touching down soon as we start closing the gap on Echo HQ. Both squads landing in the dead center. Oh, wasting no time. Guild already got that Spitfire and the G7 ready to unleash. Getting a crack over on the other side. Thanks to Waltzy. Tries to go for the follow-up. Waltzy going to be able to navigate away while Guild gives him suppressed fire. But he is unstoppable. He's nice. holding such a nice little head glitch here, too. He's forcing them to go to him. He's got two knocked. And it looks like Legacy are your first team to go out for our first game. Moist take the 50-50 with the dub. It can't be Guild. Not only clutching it, but getting all three kills. This plays out just like their contest yesterday with the first game going to Moist and in quick order as well. With Echo HQ having also a ring console and a crafter, you could not ask for a better start out of Moist. And with a zone coming to them as well, this is looking like, well, the lobby's about to get a little, a little soaked. Oh no. Hashtag moist. They are looking to stay here and I'm, oh man, I don't know Dia if it's us that is cursed, but this is, okay, so when we were over in Amia covering the action, Echo HQ had two circles pull in that direction. It looks like now for our first game, open up the doors because we are moving right over to Echo once again for this next circle. Now, it could be pulling a little bit more north. We've seen that happen before, but I'm thinking about that ring console that's also right there by Echo. Because we've got the chance to take a look at Dark Zero, it does appear that their bets are that this is going really far south into Echo as well. I, I'm hesitant mostly because you know the you know you know the fallacy where you see something time and time again and you go, okay, well it's gonna be that again. I, <laughs> part of me just thinks we might go up towards Pylon, but uh, that that might just be the copium. I could, you know, we're going to have to see. I think it is Copium, but it would be crazy if it just took a very hard turn and pulled in that direction. We're going to have to see with more teams making their way over to Echo. Currently see already a fight happening on your screen. Sentinels right through the smokes. Arcan backing away here, but I like the different adjustments that Sentinels have been really trying to approach. They're willing to try a bunch of different things as long as it works out for them, but it looks like Moist can't catch a break. Dark Zero, knowing that this 50-50 was gonna happen, took a trident and immediately rotated into Echo, but that's also the fact that it's a double whammy. They know who lands here, but they also want to get ahead of the other squads that are in the middle of their rotation. 
on paper, this is a really late fight to take. There's plenty of opportunity for third parties, and I do like that Dark Zero are playing it conservatively after applying a little bit of pressure to Moist. They themselves, however, do get rolled up on from behind, and Eternal, who land over in Devastated Coast, have easy access to harassing Dark Zero. Both teams now forced to play on the outside, leaving Moist again, large and in charge in the central building of Echo getting flashbacks when you were able to access the rooftop over here by Echo from that zip line. With some adjustments, though, some of these teams have been able to take advantage of being inside of that building. I also want to highlight, we see these shots getting taken with the triple take from Phony. He's about to try to maybe put up the wall in this rotation, but the pick rates on the top of your screen. I just want to talk about the fact that Bangalore has a 100% pick rate right now in this lobby. While we see two Lobas, 10 Conduits, and 15 Catalysts. The walls have come up. X marks a spot nocturnal now moving away all for to the other side trying to stay out of the line of sight of the team right in front of them but they're looking to back away nice shot from what looked like a 30 30 coming from complexity this is something that Hodzik has actually praised Nocturnal for, being able to, on Bangalore, be really aggressive, get up in other teams' faces, cause a problem for them. And he does just that with the smokes initially, but Xet have expended a big old cooldown to get a meager, meager rock to play behind. It is not a good position for them at all, and if anyone rolls up behind Xet, they are gone. What's crazy is that out of the 19 squads in this lobby, only six of them are not in this circle initially in this Echo HQ location. It is insane how congested already that next pool has been with over the rest of the lobby waiting here on each different side of Echo. Complexity not slowing down anytime soon, though. The Conduit ult slowing them down, taking the tick of damage that left Kimchi 1. They're looking for the reset, and they are able to get that Catalyst up. And that's after taking a knock onto Koifel as well. So Complexity have a numbers advantage. Now that even Monsoon's been able to pop the shield bat, it turns into so much more of an effective hit point differential. Monsoon can go ahead and go on a flank, but these stairs are really awkward, and Xset still stay on top, hitting for triple. They've got Koifel back up. Xset have equalized things, in fact, taken a big advantage now over complexity, turning the tables by using the high ground, the access to the stairs in their favor instead. And it's even better for Exit to wait on this high ground while Complexity know that there's another team shooting at them and pressuring them from right behind. Exit's actually pinging that same location by the bunker doors if they want to try to counter rotate already, try to get out of this situation with other teams looking to rotate from the east side of the circle, exiting out of launch pad and devastated coast. Complexity aren't giving up on this, though. They almost take down Koi, and Xset have to turn their entire focus back to this stairway. An ult Excel was popped, giving Fun the ability to lay down the energy barricade once again, but Xset are hesitant to use it. They don't want to have pulled off an ult Excel simply to get the ult forced out defensively again. Complexity continue to pressure. They're now being looked at from above, and Xset are hemorrhaging resources just to stay alive on this platform. While Furia are suffering right now, Madness is outside the circle because he can't cross yet. He's getting pressured out. They had used the wall, what looked like earlier, to try to at least close in that gap. Hopefully, Madness is going to be able to reset and make his way over. But the wall has gone down, so he needs some suppressed fire from his Watson. You know what else is going eliminated. down? Yep. <laughs> Exit <laughs> are gone. That place, not exactly what they were hoping to play in the long term. Dark Zero are being unseated at the very top, be it Arc Star Spam, be it Cat Spam. Furia want to make their way over, and the way has been cleared for Zero to walk on, join the team. Dark Zero do still hold the high ground, but whether they'll be able to actually keep Furia at bay is an entirely other question. I don't suspect that Furia are going to give them a lot of space to work with. Dark Zero at least being here on the high ground. It's about the teams with the 30-30s over to the right side. I know Optic is coming in from the south side of the circle too, with four other teams matching that from the west side of Echo. Currently see Dark Zero dropping down. They had the opportunity. They were able to get that brick, and they're fine with just giving up that space. They'll fight their way right back into the high ground. That is Furia eliminated in 18th.
You don't get to be neighbors with Dark Zero, but you know what Dark Zero get out of this is a large amount of sustain. They were running low on things like bats and importantly cells as we got later into the rings, and now that they've got the full kills on the members of Furia, they get to inherit all of that leftover loot. They start making their push up, trying to find a little bit of purchase, moving over, not even in Echo HQ yet, just fighting on the line up to Devastated Coast. Face finding temper, I believe, on the other side, and it's the fight for that ring console that is right by Devastated Coast on the north side. Meat lovers waiting in the distance. Bay is getting bombarded by some nades. They're looking to take this fight. Panders already entry fragging with the R301 over to the other side. Thank goodness that R301 is back on the ground. Love seeing that weapon out into play here, too, without having to rely on that replicator. And temper doesn't like being on the low ground here. They're actually trying to counter-rotate, getting right back onto the high ground, right next to Phase by Devastated Coast, but they can leave their back open by meat that are coming in from the bridge that is not where the meat goes on the sandwich it should not be on the outside and i get the feeling the meat lovers are about to rectify that cat reinforced doors are not going to be long for this world especially with ults being thrown on top of them over sleepers go down big nade crack on the inside for tech and now with the bloodhound ultimate you've got just a couple seconds left on this massive information as temper very quickly make their exit and a wise one at that vicky being caught between these two teams was going to be a death sentence for temper and i'd rather take my chances on the low ground i saw one smoke nade and then i blinked and temper was out of there they sped ran their way into that low ground they wanted no business after realizing that they were pinched between two teams Smart decision here, while they did drop down, they have to look at the teams that are still playing on the edge, like PLP. Looking at them here, as you can see on your maps, this is pulling 100% towards Echo HQ. Look how many teams are still sharing some of that infrastructure of Echo over to the left side. Ape Gang, Nine Lives, trying to gatekeep teams like Elevate and Disguised, who are still in Barometer. And can we just compare this briefly in our minds to what we saw in EMEA this morning? In EMEA, there are still four or five squads trying to rotate through Pylon at this point, waiting for the next ring to close. In North America, everyone has a spot in Echo HQ. Doesn't have to be a good one, but everyone sat somewhere coexisting with way too little room to breathe even nine lives who have been forced out onto the gravity cannon still don't have to fight elevate until two rings from now it's crazy here how many of these teams have been able to coexist and they're still doing some poke damage from afar you can hear those 30 30 shots ringing through the air while face have also slightly backed up still sticking to the high ground here they're looking at the team that have made their way across the bridge. Who will initiate first? Because you still see Temper hanging out on the low ground. If they see any knocks happening, they could easily try to counter-rotate and then sandwich meat if they decide to take that fight. But it looks like they're already in the middle of rotating. PLP is providing some extra pressure, preventing them from getting a clean rotate. Temper could still find themselves sandwiched, though, once the circle starts closing in the next 40 seconds. And this is going to be a very late rotate for both teams because neither one wants to open their backs to the other. With FaZe not, of course, wanting to give that up to meat lovers who will run at you. And the same being said on the other side. It means that both teams will have to fight not just each other, but now Temper who has taken the rotation, as we just mentioned, ahead of them. And that's still not including the one squad elevate that could come from pylon and take a northern rotation in as well we're introducing a lot of teams into this potential northern rotate because this next zone is the one that's going to take a lot of squads out you can no longer tank ring in zone three it is going to have to be move into zone find a place to stay or die outside of it Oh, Panders, he got beamed while trying to take that evac, trying to find some sort of safety, landing on the ground to all those 30-30s, and it don't stop with line of sight on the bridge. Meat is putting in some extra pressure. You've already used the cat wall, but where do you even go? Hiding around the other oh. side of the wall, you're getting bombarded by nades. He is playing a scene out of the Matrix. If it isn't the nades, oh, it's the bangle that you have to avoid, and now they're forced out of their position. Not a lot of cover on these boxes. We've seen them be pretty easily pushed just a couple hours ago. Nice focus fire from FaZe does at least remove the threat of the conduit 
from in front of them, but from behind them, Meat Lovers will be cresting that hill. FaZe need a better place to play, and they need it now. Committing down onto the low ground. Zero makes the first move, and he goes down before he even touches the rock. That is crazy how fast he got deleted almost immediately right there. Zero from a distance with that 30-30. The Havoc also coming in from Complexity, really helping them out, taking a look at where that team may be sitting in behind that rock. But it's the extra pressure from this northeast side that Complexity has been holding ever since that beginning fight with Exet. Do appreciate the Complexity have managed to orchestrate a hold of the low ground. Not everything is looking in order for them, however. You'll notice that, at least for Louis, there are no big heals right now. It's all coming down to six shield cells. I believe four syringes left. Complexity, as a three-person group, cannot have a whole lot more than that. And while they are blessed by the fact that not a lot of people have actually been fighting them for this spot, eventually, Complexity are going to get pushed. Worry down here for Snipe down and Panders. Look at this positioning. Right before Meat Lovers is going to have to move forward, like you mentioned, but they will still be in the line of sight of PLP, Dark Zero. Optic is behind Dark Zero right now, too, and Moist is still holding it down inside of Echo HQ, but it's all the chaos. A snipe down is incredibly low. Panders gives him some suppressed fire, while Tech on the high ground coming in. He just finished getting himself a new Tesla, by the way. So he is feeling himself, feeling confident with the rest of his squad. But where are they going to be moving on to next? This is going to be a difficult rotation with little to no cover. Evac Tower, not a bad idea, but far from a sure move. As ultimately after this evac, the meat lovers will still have to find a place that does not exist realistically for them inside of Echo. DSG make their move as E8 crawl up behind them, now owning the gravity cannon. E8 also not yet in zone, and Zap barely makes it down to this fence line without getting beamed. At least he's got the wingman in hand, ready to get some revenge. Looking right through the smokes, though. Elevate with this rotation out of the gravity cannon. They have to make sure nobody else comes right behind them. I know Ape Gang is still playing slightly outside the circle. I believe they're one of the squads running the Loba, so trying to play for that late game. Disguise, though, hiding inside of a corner, about to get pinched by E8 on the other side. It is complexity hearing the fighting. They're looking to get into a corner for this next circle, and it's only Timmy who's alive with the bolt in hand. He's got a gold mag. They're looking to rush him, playing right behind the knockdown, but it's just way too much. He he gets taken down. It is Elevate. And right on the other side, you see Complexity Monsoon with the Sentinel putting in the work. Okay, Zach. Okay. It was impressive, but it was momentary. It was fleeting for E8 as they, as well as DSG, who both rotated in late, could not ultimately find a space to play. And they are not the only ones. A lot of teams expired on their way in. The one squad I haven't seen show up in the kill feed is Meat that took the late evac tower and have not been punished for it. Complexity spot a rampart on the low ground which is going to be an interesting puzzle to solve as they will ultimately have to play this side of echo hq let's hear how they do it go to the spot please they're on the egg glitch here 95 on one i gotta back up okay we gotta watch Baiting our back that, though that. we're really good here in the cubby yeah it's, gonna, it's in yeah. Yeah, careful of northeast right now full heal i right, bang here take this ultimate I'll be right now. we maybe would have just rat here yeah, I don't I know. know how good it'll be though. You I just have to smoke us up here. How many yeah, digits do you guys have? I have one. I have, I have one. I have one. I have one. I have one. Right left side. Play yeah, right. Right. You, you, you just smoke us right here. We shoot on them. Yeah. That Bengal team, they're rising over there on the north, okay? Just careful right now. Careful right now. Don't push this. Oh, take damage. Okay? Right, you're right, you're right. They're pushing us though, I think. On yeah, the left. I know, I know. I'm going to look. Any cells? Yeah, inside that corner. I'm going to drop two. I have two. That's it. I'm going to get the This is kind of bad. They smoked us. Uh, we have to, I have to take the missile. 195 on the northwest, close, boys. Nice, I have wall in a second. We just lived through a wall. Your smoke. Careful, Shoot it, damn it. I can't see that ult. I got wall. wall. Oh, good wall. Play on top of place. I, I put ult down too. I put ult down too. They're going to ape us. They're going to ape us. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. We no, don't have to overswing for this. Oh, they're above. 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 Dead, dead, dead. You win this. Save my neck. Save my neck. You win this one. One two. Well, literally one. Give me shield! Fuck, boys! I didn't really be- 
No way. Just like that, a falling bloodhound right on top of their heads, Dia. You may miss it, but the Bluth was not in their favor here. Losing out in that corner, it was tricky. You heard how chaotic those comms were. And Meat Lovers getting involved in the corner, finding themselves right back to the lobby. Eternal is still alive as they're able to get the reset now to Void. It's happening to Eternal, too. That's the problem with dropping on a team. Somebody else is going to drop on you. The low ground is tough to play for a reason, and a lot of teams are taking the bait, playing it instead. Some of them, however, have no choice. Optic, one of those squads that actually plays in the middle of the playable space right now, still technically on low ground, but having height critically on some unfortunate teams below them. One such team, Dark Zero, who now has to face off against Optic, who have the height advantage. And this is Optic who made that rotation from down beast right behind Dark Zero, playing right behind them here too. Moist have not moved from this spot, but they've also denied themselves looting opportunities since this is where they land. Look at what they're working with here. Waltzy, although 47 on the 30-30 should be fine, the Volt is looking lackluster in terms of energy ammo. Now right in front of them though, they do see Optic gaming, and Optic cannot give up this high ground with Moist being right across from them. And it is just four squads left right next door to Moist. Sentinels have set themselves up with a Watson. It's keeping Moist from pushing out and getting involved, helping to shut down Dark Zero on the low ground, but also probably the only thing keeping Optic alive. It's crazy, too, is that face is still alive. I believe as a rat with Sentinels also playing right below Moist. Dark Zero on the edge by the fence line. Optic Gaming looking to rotate. Dark Zero here, some fighting. You can see the pings. Will they be able to initiate too with the conduit ult that they've laid down? Look at where Snipe Down is right next to Dark Zero. They don't see him just yet. He's playing from inside of the piercing spikes. Me slowly chewed through and dropped is the one to claim that kill. Another point goes to Optic. Dark Zero emerge in the midst of a smoke, cut off by a cat wall now, turning around to fight Sentinels, but ultimately having to dip back out of the ring. Moist, with no problem whatsoever, have a firing range to work with. It is like loading into the practice tool. Moist, clean house, taking out Optic and waiting for the wall to drop as it should in the next five seconds. They can't get any loot from this. Bangalore ult stopping them, creating that space. But with only one left, Moist, the patience is over. We highlighted them for a reason. Take game number one with the ring favoring them all the way to their POI. That's great timing from Moist. They don't have to worry about pushing through a catalyst wall because they saw when it went down and are fully aware that there's not enough time for any team on the other side to reset. Instead, they play with this ultimate high ground that's available to him at Echo HQ, and we start to understand outside of just its loot why it's such a powerful POI. Because unlike Lightning Rod, where when, it, when the zone pulls to you, you kind of have to pick a building and work with it, in Echo HQ, you just stay where you landed, and it's also Godspot. Not only that, you also have the chance of either getting a replicator sometimes. You saw the ring beacon also being right to the north of Echo. Yes, sometimes you also get in a devastated coast, but we saw what was happening over there where we had a three-way fight for the teams that were also rotating by launch pad. So that was a really good spot for Moist to be, and that's why they were fighting for that POI against Legacy. But we have to see where that next circle is going to be pulling because, once again, Moist really woke up on World's Edge, and if this is how they're starting their day, I'm expecting that momentum to keep rolling. And on the opposite end of this, can we just take a moment and think about how Legacy must be feeling after having lost that contest and looking back at it? In fact, let's look back at it one more time because the way this game played out, it could have been Legacy at the top. But with the way that Gildersons clutched up the early game, we said this contest was going to change the game. I didn't know it would be by this much. Look at the little head glitch that he's holding to over to the other side. Like, there, there's nothing you could do about him holding that positioning if you decide to take a fight, if your legacy in that position, unless you actually close in the gap while knowing you'll probably get shot anyways from the back. So, that was a beautiful position for them to hold. But we get to take a look at more highlights. The early fight between Complexity and an X set, as well as FaZe getting stuck, but FaZe somehow living as a solo till top four at the very end. This is where we had to say goodbye to X set in the lobby, being our third, or rather our 
second team to go out here. But with Exit, try to hold on for dear life. They're out in the open between so many other teams that had them on their sides. We saw Furia go down shortly afterwards with Dark Zero also making a very quick rotate on a Trident. They were the second team to run into Moist. But with so many other squads not wasting any time yet to get into this final circle, that's why it was so chaotic by the fifth side. And it's very difficult to rotate in from the north. And I know it's diff I, I know it's hard because when you look at Echo HQ, it does appear to be all the way south of the map, but ultimately rotating in even from the eastern side is better than rotating in from the north because it claims so many teams, this little dip before the actual POI itself uh, that has so many squads funnel into it like Exet, like the Meat Lovers almost did. And of course, like E8 did moments later, sliding down into the little village outside of Echo HQ. It's really tough to escape a low ground position here. And uh, as much as teams tried their best, ultimately it was what claimed Dark Zero as well. Their drop down took them straight into Optic and ultimately both teams had to walk straight into Moist. And the fact that Moist was also able to clean up that one squad that was right in front of them in the middle of that rotate before the bang ult was called in is great. That's three extra KP on top of the dub. I believe they finished with that last KP with 10 kills in total for that squad. So a nice way to start off your day here after game number one. I, I, I'd agree. And this is, as you say, game one. So there's still going to be plenty of variation. You would imagine that this doesn't play out like EMEA and we don't go to Echo HQ twice. But even if it were to, the likelihood that we get very different top threes is very high because Apex Legends is inherently going to have a little bit of variance in between games. So I can't wait to see what teams come out on top next. Yeah, while we calculate all the standings here, guys, cannot wait to take you guys through game number two. We are continuing on the domination onto Storm Point, and that will come to you on the other side of this break. Welcome back, fans, here to the ALGS. It's day three in our split, and it's time to get into the action for game two. Rain Day, and now joining with Dia on the mics. What a great game, number one, Dia. We had a pop-off from Moist. We called it, but it's always just a guess until it really happens. Yeah, like I said, when I thought that the contest was going to impact the game, I didn't think it would be to the tune of 5,000 damage and 10 kills for Moist. Oh. Added on top of their placement, this means so much for them because starting off with a 22-point game is going to put them far and away ahead of the leaderboard. Well, this one goes out to Genome. I just hope he's watching North America's finest duel it out here. You know, Moist Esports and uh, Dark Zero. I mean, really just homegrown squads. Obviously, jokes here around Apex South taking over. I mean, you know, and, and yes, they're playing here now. But you got to say, these two teams from that region now representing and playing in North America, it is phenomenal what they've been able to do. They've turned it around and become favorites in every sense of the word. Sentinel's a really good performance. They're way down in the ranking so far. Optic and FaZe falling out our top five, but it's really just the story of our top two right now. And, and I will add a, a second storyline here, complexity. 
10 points yep. off of eight kills you cast that as well i mean they were they were stuck in some tricky situations with phase and with me but they they had a lot going on in that game i can honestly say that i've never seen a team work the low ground like complexity did mm. there's got to be some serious scrim time put into mastering that specific ending and the way that they were able to play it to such effective kp nine lies of course did come out with a remarkable amount of kills as well and they're one of my teams to watch simply because they are also like e8 a preseason qual team but one that was somehow even less on people's radar until they started coming into preseason qualifiers and slaying teams it is hard to get on the radar especially in a region like north america with so many big names and so accomplished but that's what these games are all about the end of the beginning well we've got one game to start it off and it's kind of what we anticipated moist up up and away, Dark Zero chasing them with Sentinels right behind. Complexity with a nice shot into the dark. And that light is burned bright. We'll see if it continues in game two on Storm Point as we jump off the drop ship and the teams land. Speaking of landing, Dia, we saw some early contest. It was between Made in Heaven and Aftermath and Amiya that kind of were their own little, I don't know, uh, Batman and Robin, except, uh, you know, you're not, they're not working together, but they were a part of the same storyline, the constant contest. Do we see that here with Legacy? Uh, and potentially now Moist, who loses Waltzy. That is a huge start to this match. It's a big turnaround for Legacy. And they got to be hoping that the ring pulls over to Echo HQ again after having effectively won. Yes, they may not get a squad wipe with Moist getting to escape into the ether, but Moist are escaping into a POIs that are claimed. Not just shots from behind them out of Legacy, but Eternal Lion wait for them at Devastated Coast, PLP at Launchpad, Evolution landing at Pylon. There seems to be no escape from the never-ending fire that's being thrown at Moist. They should go here, I would imagine, and... If you're looking at the map as we are, they are going to be near a uh, way to recover their teammate. And I think that is one of the benefits of Conduit, being able to get those banners. So they should be able to have a chance to get back as a full three and have Waltzy, but it's going to take a minute uh, for sure. And and not, not all is guaranteed as well as we take a look at the overall situation. After such a devastatingly good start, it was a devastatingly poor one for moist and you know it looks to be another southern zone it could even pull very close to echo as we had seen in game one dso pretty similar start here in storm point at least in terms of map i'll be honest i wasn't gonna say anything i, I was just <laughs> i was just gonna let it happen and uh. see if we went echo but with evolution rotating in it seems that a lot of teams are once again placing their bets that we're playing out a nearly identical zone. PLP are getting in position. Over sleepers have already started to rotate in, but miraculously with Moist being able to survive, uh, they should be essentially watching the kill feed to see when Legacy goes out, because as long as you're able to stay above Legacy in the standings, Moist can call this a win on the contest where they've already done quite well for themselves in the first game. Maxet flying in as well. We find ourselves towards another conversation with Yanya, Yaguarez, and Niazul. LG, that's kind of the three players we were so consistently seeing, representing and hailing from Mexico, and now no longer represented with LG. That's now Sweets, who's been off of NRG and put together his squad, the Funk and Slayer, to be the top of North America. But what does that leave Legacy? It leaves them, in my eyes, with something to prove. It's a team that has always been so good team fighting has been their strength not necessarily winning big events but certainly being threatening within the top five and whenever in a situation where they're playing edge or coming across a moment where you need a big game from them certainly a team that unlike unlike all teams they can drop a 20 kill game uh pretty regularly and get enough to just maybe shift their their standings in an overall six game matchup 
And I dare say, Randy, that I expect them to, especially in matches like this. Now, when you're a team that drops over an Echo, like we said with Moist, it's your job to be able to read that zone better than anyone else. And it's very curious to me that Legacy have chosen not to stay in Echo and instead move out to Devastated Coast. I think they're hedging their bets, saying this isn't actually going Echo. It's going to pull up further north, and we are going to be on the eastern side of the ring where nobody else is. That's an interesting thing. I mean, if we could... If it is possible to take a look at that just for the map for clarity because that that's kind of a big decision you're talking about teams going is it going to end up exactly as it was last game or are we going to go just a little bit to our east and and that means an entirely different rotation if you're trying to run kind of western side and south because that means you're right there you're fine you're not going to have anyone behind you but if it goes farther east you are going to have to push through every team that's in front of you versus having no one at your back versus now having to go through six different teams it, it is a very big gamble that these squads are making phase one of those squads that usually okay with fighting as well but are in that south side looking to get some poke with the havoc from range is very tricky and content with that so far maximizing the use of the conduit as well keeping panders topped up one of the benefits of course with conduit mm. is that if you are aware that you're not going to get into a fight you can use the conduit tactical just to maintain your shields while you evo them giving yeah. yourself an even better chance of having greater armors while also not expending resources in order to mm. keep yourself in the poke battle that's a great point too just about the fact that a lot of these games unlike games that you might be playing yourself at home have to do with teams there committing to an area very early and now how are we going to level up our evos we've got to get involved we have to poke that's why you often see at least something like a 30 30 maybe a nemesis some type of medium to long range available a scout great example as well to be able to do damage here but also have an impact because you do have to trade off between are we going to get involved in this fight are we going to third party or are we going to play the zone if you have a scout a lot of times you call hey fight happening left let's get some kp off of that and you can get one or two pieces while you're still holding onto a zone that might win you the game and that's exactly what plp are trying to do rkn playing a little bit of hide and seek by himself there optic knows where he is and they don't like it they're trying to get him off his back as well but no one going too aggressively too far here let's take a look at the map oh my lord and legacy even at their poi gamble wrong moving out to devastated mm. coast when now the zone pulls us back into echo this is i, I will say highly unusual it's four yeah. zones in one day across two regions wow but a move like this is still going to change things for legacy and not for the better I mean, look at this, too. I mean, you, you see all those teams of the right. We were kind of talking about the problem for that team far left. If if you consider, I think it might have been Sentinels, where let's let's talk about nine lives, uh, a squad that is there. They're OK. They can sit. They can wait. Had that pulled towards coast. It is a heck of a fight between Evolution, Optic, Sentinels, PLP, X set just to get in. So right now, all is well in terms of the call. A lot more to do, Dia, in terms of that, though. You still got to play. And a hit, kind of an unusual 20 teams still alive in this lobby. Not one squad has fallen here so far. And check out Dark Zero, who are going to be playing right along that edge in the zone. Wow. Could be our first squad to go down, especially as they get noticed and have to go all the way back on this rotation. But they've taken almost exactly the same move as they did last game, much mm. like Sentinels, who have repeated their performance. Dark Zero, however, hemorrhaging meds outside of the ring and ultimately will have to fight for the priority over gravity cannon where we already know elevate likes to go late yeah this is going to be an interesting rotation with dark zero i like following this along you're right because they have to use the meds here early they've got 19 seconds before the zone starts to push in so it's going to be interesting they'll run into kind of the edge of where teams are holding off echo but they're not going to push so as long as they can kind of stabilize and and fight off of elevate gaming which will run into dark zero now they'll be okay but that's a big if because those two teams are playing very very well and they're beginning their fight as complexity still sit inside this building 
bit of a different read from complexity as well. We haven't touched on it. The way that they played the low ground was something that we discussed at the end of last round, and it was an early prediction from them as well. Having them also be a team as complexity that have elected to play a little further north, a little outside wow. of last game's zone, they'll also be in a bit of a tough position Ooh. towards the next couple of rings. Double cat walls have been used by Dark Zero and E8 respectively in order to give each other space for the fight, but neither one really fully wants to commit to this engagement, especially not without an initial knock. Dark Zero get rounded on over this head peak at the hill, oh, no. and now we're right in the line of sight of E8. It's temp and EA both firing at Dark Zero, your winners of day one, and perhaps about to be shut down. And that is just unlucky from Dark Zero. They had a chance to push Elevate. They had a ton of damage, and they just didn't go for it. I think they were worried about what just happened with Temper pushing in, but in the same way, because they were worried about it, it almost sealed their fate. They will lose all but Zero, who is still alive, and Elevate. Zap and Zack doing their scout's honor duty to try to make sure that they can make a claim and he is gone and he is not coming back. Zero, is that a quick potential res there? Or just That's a craft of some it. meds? Wow, that would be amazing if they can do it. And it is kind of a new world where you drop down and you can fight right away, but Elevate, they're still stuck on it. They do not want any chance of Dark Zero playing behind them. And they're actually going into zone to try to finish that off. I'll be honest, if it's my ranked game, I'm letting the reset happen because this next <laughs> yeah, zone is KP, closing. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it, like, it, it, it just seems like it would benefit them. This is for the second time this game. I'm going to point it out. The ring actually took out Disguised, unable to manage their meds in exactly the same way. First, it was a knock on one member, and then two quickly followed. They're not the only ones as E8 moved into the zone and took out Dark Zero, but that makes two teams that have completely expired outside of the ring without ever touching Echo HQ. You know, and this is a team that you highlighted. What makes Elevate so interesting in, in, in your eyes and kind of what they've done here? Obviously, they could fight, um, but, but they're making good decisions, Dia. They, they really are, and a lot of this comes down to, in my opinion, Zach, I think that they've got three great working parts, and I'm a fan of all of the individual players, but we're seeing this happen with great IGLs across Apex Legends history. Of course, there's Hal, and that's a bit of an exception, but then we look at teams like Dark Zero, and even with Zero, who's been sticking with Jen Burton for a while, you've basically got a format with older, experienced IGLs where they go, I know exactly what I'm doing, and I'm going to pick up two crazy, consistent controller players to to help me do it. And Elevate follows that same philosophy, with Zack Mazer perhaps not having the same accolades as Dark Zero and TSM fans benefit from. This same format, and the fact that I've listened to a lot of Zack Mazer comms from his C9 days, I think is going to work out really well. It's a very mm. smart IGL. He hasn't gotten here for no reason. No, I mean, Zack's honestly had a great opportunity to be at lands he unfortunately got sick in that first land uh and uh graceful with cloud nine had to take his place they ended up i think top tenning uh but getting into that final day which is amazing but you look at that ability to do it certainly it's more just consistency maybe elevate that squad to do it moist can you believe it we saw their first fight it did not go well they found a way with conduit and mt to get the banners back and be alive as a three let's listen in and see if they can keep this luck rolling you guys need to move though i'm i'm just dead i'm dying for you guys okay yeah i don't know if i'm making around though you just gotta try Hey, I'm dead too. Wow. That might have killed me. I mean, not lucky, I would say, at all. And in the pro league, it's hard to kind of count on being lucky. People just don't miss shots as often as they did. Good job to get the three back, but as I like to say, it was a day late and a dollar short to you. And with Moist going down, we had to compare them to Legacy, who actually fell even before them. That's both teams that initially should have had an advantage in this ring that are now fallen with zero points each. We haven't even cracked the top 15, but Xset, who fell in the first couple of squads last game, have made a miraculous recovery and are fighting out of the IMC Armory. And Nocturnal, even with the Catwall in his face, almost takes down one, and Koifel finishes the job on Panders. FaZe are in trouble. Xset Koi. Going for it. This man is supposed to be a prodigy. 17 and 18, just bursting onto the scene. 
at such a young age and now finding that moment with fun FPS and Nocturnal gain some maturity in this pro league certainly stepping up and serving what most would have expected just excellence when it comes to aiming and winning those fights another fight going the way of Xset Furia has been doing some damage alongside their route as well towards a potential win and his Watson back in the pro league back off of his retirement and his hiatus certainly come back with some vigor and some verve I think gaming though maybe the most important story so far with Moist being gone Elevate has really played spoiler to Dark Zero and have a, has a chance here to be on the outskirts of a, a decent spot in zone with 13 squads still left it's the same rotation as they tried to make last game, just one ring earlier. And I love how it's worked out for them with a little bit of posturing through the windows. This isn't going to hurt anybody. EA don't even want to take out the squad inside of this building. As much as it would be nice to get the KP, it's completely irrelevant to EA's game plan. They want to play around the outside, moving into Echo HQ later, like Furia are. But as we said, EA did it first. Now can they punish Furia? They should. And and if they know that Fury is going to sit there, they know they either have to move or they have to get engaged. But it's not actually going to be Elevate that starts this. It seems like Nine Lives has maybe gotten involved in trying to poke outside and Elevate have lost Zach in the process. FaZe Zeratricky has gone down as well. The Koifel on the other side. And I'm Madness, back with two full reds, is going to play maybe the worst role for Elevate, which is the one to finish them off as they cannot withstand much more than this. It's gonna be one, it's gonna be two. Maybe a third will survive, but it's Furia's zone now. Nine lives still inside. Hugely problematic. That is devastating for E8 as Nine lives again, two teams that could, should have been able to coexist, ended up clashing for an unforced reason. Neither one particularly benefiting, although in this case, I think Nine lives will be pretty happy that they saw the team on the outside who was emoting on them taken down. <laughs> now Furia get to move in uncontested and take on Nine lives themselves. And Furia, the fact that they can just be inside is huge, but don't, don't forget that Elevate Shubi is still alive though zap and zap cannot contribute placement points are still around for the taking and with 12 squads left and not a lot of space you're gonna start to see those squads shrink meat lovers and tech with the prowler in hand it's 58 and it's not enough to get a clean kill they're gonna back off there and with the horizon all just a second for a wands to say if we needed to looks like we don't let's hold rather be patient and alive and hasty and dead that's very true. Interestingly enough, Meat play out of a similar position. They have been hasty at times, but it's been fascinating to watch them in their second day of Pro League take a bit of a breather. They look especially practiced around these zones, even though it hasn't net them a top five finish yet. Furia play things slow, everybody preparing in almost a calm before the storm way for this next ring. The squad's up on top of Echo HQ. Squads like Complexity really benefiting from it. I, I, I think this is absolutely one of the better spots to have. The only issue is you have a lot of teams rotating past you, but you want to have this high ground if you can. PLP, the only team center zone down at the bottom near this kind of tropical tree that you saw there on the south. Madness peeking over. He slides back and Keon finishes the job. Nice tag team duo. And Fury with 10 points. Fifth place over on the lobby. Nine lives goes down. We have 10 squads left with round five closing in. Just 15 seconds, and they're going to have to make some type of play here. But Furia, they'd rather wait. They have angles. They have support. They're fully loaded. I'm Madness 25 away. Only a few damage away from that red shield as well. So Furia in a really good position here. The Meat Lover is not in such a fantastic one. Ultimately trying to crest Echo HQ, shot out of the sky, and with just Luxford left. I don't believe they'll be able to survive, maybe evading some attention for now. Can Luxford even get Tech back into the game without prompting a push from the surrounding teams? Sentinels are looking down on it. And when Sentinels are looking to get aggressive, you know that you're really down bad. That's one of those things that, you know, it's been a big story with RKN trying to find those right moments to really showcase just the intelligence that he's had. He joined us on the desk and uh, clearly became friends with a lot of us here. But in terms of his pro plays, absolutely had something to prove. And he's been fine being willing to prove that and continuing 
to guide his teams to these final zones. This would be a major moment to be able to clean this one up because so far, Furia are looking pretty good in terms of holding their own space. Monsoon and Complexity, we know how powerful their spot has been. They have the high ground all along. And now we see X set. We're going to find out. Can they somehow put it together? Fun FPS, Koifel, the Young Gunner, and Nocturnal. Can they get the dub? Let's listen in and see how they play this end zone. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, I'm so. We're doing way too much. I have 120 we might get, We might get swung. We might get swung. Okay. Low what ground might swing us, and then south might swing us. Did you save him? What gun? You, you're on and heavy, right? Yeah, on and heavy. Just chill. Just, everybody's in a fight. Just chill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch your drops, watch your drops, boys. Watch your drops. Yep. Dead above me? Yep. Not yet. I have ult. 7%. Okay. This is like ultimate save from low ground. We need to be careful with yeah. that. Yep. yep. Someone's ballooning. Someone just healed right here above us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see them. Ooh. No one ballooning. Yep. Wall went down. Yep. Look here, I'm looking here. Yep. Team, team close, team close, West. team close. West. Okay. You might be able to peek him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn it. I'm gonna burn it. I'm gonna burn it. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. They might, they might just send oh us. They God, might just. Bloons, bloons, bloons. 120, 130, 130 in them. Kill two. All dead. All dead. All dead. I can ult above. I can ult above. I'm ulting above also. We play bingo. Play bingo. Play bingo. Okay. I'm we batting. just kill after. We kill after bingo. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's a team on low ground. Team on low ground. Yeah, yeah. We just commit and kill a high ground. Commit and kill a high ground. I'm, I'm waiting that bingo. I'm waiting that bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Bingo. There's a bomb. Where? What? Yeah. Oh, okay. Climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up. Go east, go east. Go east. Go east. Play to me. Yeah. I'm here, I'm here. I'm holding this, I'm holding this, I'm holding this. Last, 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 in the knockdown, in the knockdown. Drop there, drop there, drop there. Wait, on me, on me. Where? On the other team balloon. Careful, north east, north east balloon. Yep. Climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up on me. Climb up, climb up. In the wall, in the wall, in the wall. Back sad with playing the Bangalore. All they gotta do is play height here. They're gonna stay alive. The gravity lift brings a few in. Koifel trying to get one of his wins here. That would seal the deal for Xset. Claiming this game. Huge hip fire shots. No 30 30. And what? somehow upset Xset and rise from the bottom to claim the top spots in game number two. It was right there, and yet falling just out of Xset's grasp. Make no mistake, this is a great game for them, but Furia, what a way to play the end zone, and off of low ground, of all things, Rain Day, very infrequently do we get to see an ending like that. You have to say and give it up to Keon. I was not sure what they were playing because we had so many teams we were following at that moment. Did they have the horizon? I think they did. And then you see Keon with that gravity lift. It brings them all up. They play low ground. They stay out of everyone's vision. Complexity and Xset, the only two teams that really had in my eyes uh, the shielding and the positioning and the track record in this game of winning their fights to take a chance. But Furia, we mentioned their shielding. We mentioned their uh, the positioning from rotating late they had just played an excellent game and to come out with the win in that kind of a zone man i want to see keon's perspective now <laughs> yeah, yeah what I, i'm, I'm sure, sure i want to watch furious take, yeah i'm sure that we'll get to take a look back at it because th this is a team that we're going to see win again furia as you said we talked about them at the start of the day this isn't for no reason they clearly have a command of the game especially in this season and it was a pleasure to watch them win a repeat zone but as we had alluded to at the end of last one it's a it plays out very differently even from game to game We've got a totally different last three teams that stay alive and almost a new winner in the ALGS. Xset survived for so incredibly long and approached this ring with a whole lot more caution than they had just last game. One of the interesting things about Furia 2 is the squad and the connection that they have, specifically Keon and his Watson, to supporting each other. If you even paid attention on Twitter and some of their interactions. It's a, bl a brotherly type love, someone that you would do anything for that those two share. And that translates to game. Adding I'm Madness here and him IGLing, you take the passion that he's got, whether you love what he says or you don't agree with what he says, you cannot deny that he's passionate and he's been one of the technically, most technically advanced pros in ALGS history. He has always been a threat when it comes to a 1v1 or raw skill. And now you put him with two other guys who are just as good, maybe even better in that category. This is a deadly lineup. This is Furia back in business, Dia.
And, and the other thing is that Madness has been playing for a long time with oh, his yeah. own teams, constructing the, over the past couple of seasons a few rosters here and there with the players he could find that, that were interested. Now that he's got an org in his back, now that he's got these two superstars with him, Madness is still playing like he's got to, as you say, frag out in the IGL position, and well, he can, he by no means has to. Take a look at the mm. way this played out last game. Keon mm. went insane with 10 kills. I mean, I knew he got him up there, but I didn't know he, he, he put him down, if you know what I mean. Put the players he was fighting down. 10 kills, 1,600 damage. His Watson right behind him only about a 50 damage difference there and you see i'm madness right behind them with only 200 to spare huge games you talk about 17 overall kills and the greatest part about it as well is you see over 20 assists between this squad they're working together they're playing together each one of them is involved in every single fight and every single down and that is resulting in well a pretty dominant performance this has shifted things because we saw Dark Zero and Moist leading as we headed out of game one. Well, now they're nowhere to be found in the top 10 and it's Furia and Xset with 29 and 19 points respectively. That should certainly put them in the mix for one of our top teams. It's a refreshing performance from them and from PLP, who making top three have got to be breathing a sigh of relief. Sentinels double up on their last game, placing top five again, continuing the refresh from yesterday and very much changing in just a single day of play. But let's take a look at the bottom 10, because as you said, a lot of things changed in this singular game. And even while we've got teams like Elevate and Meat Lovers making top 10, Moist and Legacy, notably absent, Dark Zero and Up, Optic, perhaps even more so, and for the second time in the same zone, DSG seem to be lost on how to play Echo HQ, this time the ring doing more damage to them than anyone else. Now, the weird part is Dark Zero, obviously, and, and Moist had a great one, and they can look exactly at what went wrong in the second one. But for teams like Disguise, like Legacy, you look at all these bottom 10 teams who have just not figured out how to do that rotation from where they are to Echo. D, I, you know, I'm a positive guy, bright side thinking, this is great to show the weaknesses of what happens if you get this zone again. And now you know, all right, we got to do this differently because if we get a zone like that in a big, in a big moment, it's not going to be easy, uh, easy for us to navigate. It very much is, and I, I am curious how teams will continue to adapt. It's clear from Sentinel's gameplay, at the very least, that teams can make big leaps in single days. And with the end of the first round, Robin, coming up, that's what we've got to look forward to. All right, well, let's take you to a quick break. We'll be right back. Catch our breath after a great Game 2. Furia, a furious match. We'll see what happens in Game 3. Welcome back everyone to the action here in the ALGS. NA is delivering and Dia, you get to take us through the action. Furia with a 17 KP 
dub? Are you kidding me? What a way to conclude game number two. Now, we still have one more game on Storm Point, but man, what a change off after what we had seen from Moist game number one. Them falling right after Legacy in game number two pretty early on. You mean we have another game at Echo HQ, right? Oh. <laughs> we haven't seen the rest of Storm Point yet, so I don't I don't know what this, this Storm Point is, but Echo HQ, that we're very familiar with at this point. Honestly, I'm just thinking that it's like Vantage's Echo just having the biggest crib out here for everyone to have a party at. Everyone gets an invite to the Echo party, and we are moving on to Storm Point once again for our next game, our final game on Storm Point before we make the transition into World's Edge. Now, I wonder if teams are going to preemptively just start rotating to the south side of the map, or if we are going to be sticking to our ring consoles so that way we can see where it may be shifting in case it does change things up here for some of these teams. The fact, though, that it did pull towards Echo could have been the opportunity for both Legacy and Moist. And we highlight these teams so much at the start of these games. It's because the 50-50s have been going down over there. So that could have given them the advantage back to back. But it didn't fare any advantage for either teams actually going into that game, which makes it all the more interesting looking at the rotation patterns that we had, even from the likes of Dark Zero, who also went out early, and Furia coming out on top. I love that you point that out, Vicky, because it is, I think, necessitated at the highest level of Apex that when the ring pulls to you, that you're making top three. And to have that not happen for either team that lands over at Echo HQ does further demonstrate a lot of the risk that comes with this POI, contesting for it early on, and perhaps not getting the loot that you want. This time, Echo HQ should have a crafter on it, giving both teams a fair shot at looting up after they land, but that depends. Oh entirely on who wins the fight and right now legacy have got a purple and a pk all right we absolutely take those i know moist had been able to acquire a blue evo from what i was able to see but yanya what can yanya make with this pk g7 in their hand here he's still rocking the white evo trying to take a different angle but i do like the fact that this wasn't a fight that was taken in close quarters like we had seen especially in that first fight that we witnessed with gil taking a nice little head glitch but nizul's literally won so moist already opening things up with the advantage about to get up close and personal, especially after the amount of damage that Waltzy was able to do, and once again making it happen uh, once more. Now with the conduit transfer, Waltzy should be able oh. to come in with the rest of the team and finish this off. Yes, MT is down, but if you're a Moist fan, I wouldn't be too concerned about it yet. The beak is out. And in the early game, especially the Mozambique's long range, high damage profile can make it a fantastic weapon for taking the early 3v3 win. I'm so glad you highlighted that. Don't sleep, don't sleep. And with the way that Guild is holding his angle, even with both his teammates down, he's in a 2v1, waiting by the edge, pops in the smoke, trying to reposition himself. He can't let them fully reset here, or is he just going to call it move back instead? He didn't have a lot of meds to work with until he picked up those two shields off the floor, and he is just calling it. He's not even going to risk it. Yanya still has that purple Evo shield full health, and instead of just sticking around, just waits for them to try to get their third back and then use that time to get away. Super smooth swap from Yanya as well, just allowing this to happen. Echo HQ finally has Legacy not just able to win the contest, but then take full advantage of the POI and move out of it, as we will be going a bit further north this time over towards Lagoon and Launchpad, where already we've got several teams set up. It should be no surprise to anyone that Sentinels are one of the first teams there. Will they be one of the first teams out as Ape Gang Gravity Cannon onto them? Temper was shooting at Guild, and now Guild is running for his life. They're doing the Spider-Man meme while they fly over each other. The voice is looking back at Legacy. Legacy is doing the same thing, and they're taking the gravity cannon back. Love being able to see that action happen in real time, but I also love even more Dia seeing a different circle. We are moving a slightly bit north from Echo HQ, but more in that center to east side of Storm Point. Furia should be... Pretty happy making their way out from wall. They had a great game last time, and this time are rotating right into a care package next door to their POI. With complexity moving in just behind them, Furia do have a limited amount of time to make their way into the next ring, and not a whole lot of ring consoles on their way. There's nothing at Command Center, nothing at Cascade. So this little bit of information that Furia got at wall is the last bit they're going to get on where the ring is going. 
to the catwalk coming up for Xset, who have taken the high ground over Dark Zero, who have the advantage in terms of evil shields, but they're not looking to try to take this fight from this position. It looks like they want to try to prioritize getting right around that next choke, seeing where Dark Zero wants to go. They already know where that next circle is already pulling, so they want to hang out here sometimes. With this circle, we could actually see it pool in exactly where Dark Zero is right now by the rocks to their right, or it could continuously pull more closer to launch pad. But Dark Zero finding that player right in front of them. It's going to be RKN going down by the 30 30 in Zero's hands. That's Sentinels that they already have the advantage for. Moving in, Dark Zero want to try to take this fight. Raynock doesn't happen off of an Arc Star, but notice how Dark Zero move around the Dark Veil that was placed and use Sentinel's own Catalyst Wall against them, making sure that it provides cover to Dark Zero from the squads in Lagoon. Sykes does overextend just a bit, not anchoring for his squad and instead wanting to frag once more and his PLP enter the fray. Does look like Sentinels are getting the worst bit of this. Dark Zero also cannot be too happy. Oh man, and that was them having to reset with Zainu being right behind Sentinels too. Look at the Picasso painting that they built up with the Watson fences, putting down the gen so that way nobody else can try to contest them here with the Bang ult being unleashed. Zero is still taking some folks though, still trying to get a little aggressive, not letting Sentinels fully reset, but the rest of his team are behind him. He wanted to try to get that purple evil if he could, at least take that one last shot as well, putting in some pressure, and it's PLP that have the high ground here. And with the banner that Dark Zero were able to recover and the purple shield, they should be able to get Sykes back into the lobby with the purple themselves, given that the new respawn mechanics will let Dark Zero sort of double up in that way. It's a retreat for them and for Disguised, a late rotate, but a much easier one through checkpoint as playing through here. They do maintain high ground for now, but would sure like access to the crafter in front of them if Optic on the other side would just let him have it. Oh, and it looks like they are, actually. You could take oh, all nice of that. We want nothing to do with it. I guess the holidays are coming even earlier than they were expecting after they just ended in disguise. This is a team that I believe very much relies on momentum. It's all about that mental state from each individual member of this team. They've started out a little rough for today, so hopefully this is this could be the start of that momentum, while Legacy are getting gatekept by the team right there by the bridge. I believe that may be Eternal. Exiting out of Devastated Coast, not letting Legacy really find their angle to try to go through that choke. And there's still a squad late rotating behind them, Dia. It's going to be Ape Gang coming close to pinch Legacy. An odd rotation from Ape Gang. We'll see if Legacy actually find out that this is happening before it bites them in the behind. Their retreat out of Eternal should let Eternal continue to play over by the southern end of Launchpad hanging out with the buildings that they've got as cover, and finally into the actual ring itself. But Ape Gang and Legacy have encountered each other on the other side, so I'm sure we'll hear a few more shots from them, perhaps see one of them show up in the kill feed after a little while. Exit's late move in to where Moist ultimately retreated to try and grab their compatriot is going to be just fine for now, but what's not great is their shield situation. This is worrying me about Exit. Mostly because they had such a good game just 20 minutes ago and need to put up similar numbers here. Especially if they do an Evo shield check and they see that Nox still has that white Evo. Although I am seeing on the feed too, Furia in a fight, getting a trade going down and we get to see the side by side. Shout out to the observers catching the action just as quickly here. His Watson low of this Evo shield isn't looking to reset just yet to give some help to Madness who is one. He needs to chase him down on that lift. Try to reset from the inside. He gets that next knock onto Shuby. It's E8 taking this fight. Not too sure if they were able to get the original res, but if so, that gives Fury some extra time to reset too. Love the way that Watson stabilizes for the team. It's a lot of practice, a lot of hours going into the way that he covered the singular res on Keon, takes out Elevate as almost an afterthought, and again reinforces for the rest of the team. Furia's reset perfection in these moments, and it couldn't have happened any sooner as Dark Zero, with Sykes back into the game, are just now passing by. A little too late to third party, but it's just by a hair. At least they get to prioritize that northern choke point rotation that overlooks the launch pad site. 
you could uh, try to approach from at least that high ground area right through that choke and they will be above furia while the rat is so that is going to be that next plan by the spider den that they're going to be able to rotate on they will be coming right behind exit though and complexity and meat lovers are on the north side of Stormcatcher, so they're right above exit so getting involved in this fray will allow exit to also be taking more cover on that low ground if they try to farm nox evil shield meat start to move down They've always been a late rotating team in these southern zones. Understandable since they've landed over at Lightning Rod. Without TSM in the group, this comes to them without contest. And FaZe encroaching on the very same territory, maybe giving us a three sided team battle. Both of these squads, of course, converging onto Exet. Complexity, phase, exit, meat lovers from above. We saw Dark Zero rotating in as well. And all of this is to the very northernmost part of the zone. What's even crazier is that Moist is still alive. Guild is still alive. I don't believe he's been able to get his teammates in just yet as they do have a conduit, but he could be getting them if he has enough time and space over by Stormcatcher where there is a replicator. So stay tuned for that while we tune into Dark Zero. Red Evil on the other side. Zero gets absolutely beamed, having to navigate away. Does have the help though from the conduit temporary shields from Sykes. So in case they try to take this fight, they could reset just as quickly. I like that Zero waits on the heals, pulling for something more efficient. Since you've already used the conduit tactical, there's no rush to get yourself in quotes, in air quotes, back into the fight. It's more about putting yourself on permanent footing and Dark Zero do just that, holding the opposite side. Meat lovers do not go on a push, but Nine Lies playing outside of Jurassic have a very different game plan. This is going to involve farming kills and with Optic on the opposite end of this fence is going to have a... Uh, a difficult game should this team either decide to push them with Optic on one, Nine Lies on the other. Both squads simultaneously want to be taking on kills, neither one wanting to cold push each other. <laughs> Both actually calling it off. Optic trying to wonder if they should try to approach there in that situation, but taking a look at FaZe and where they're sitting in right now in the circle. Want to see if they want to wrap all the way around, but if they do, they will be running into Evolution and Eternal over by Launchpad. This is the overhead that we have of Exet. That's that low ground I had mentioned before, too. No one's going to try to contest them for that while we see that lone survivor from Complexity over to the right side before he finally got taken out. I'm sorry. I feel like I cursed that right there. See the evac tower being called in at the very end, too. But with that next circle... That circle that is right on the outskirts of that lone house away from Launchpad. We've seen this circle before, and Sentinels had called it. And with their composition, Dia, we know that this is a team that likes to play for those final circles, especially with the Watson. 100 percent and all credit to rkn for these circle predictions it's been now three games in a row that rkn puts his team in a position to get at the very least top five and defending it as well after a disastrous early clash with dark zero makes this all the more impressive the ring and many teams still have to move into Lagoon, however. And it's worth noting that there are not a whole lot of places that you can actually play in Lagoon. The rocks provide very little cover, and even where Dark Zero are currently sat is not going to provide you a lot of safety long term. Catwall gets used. Zero desperately needing to be rezzed after this shield bat. It should be the time for Dark Zero to try and get their IGL back into the fight. Well, they were able to get a trade and get a knock onto Yubin as well. So getting this trade off and the reset with the Thermite, they're in the line of it's sight. It's two the down. Right above them, Zainu. What a Thermite in the angle that he was in. It's only up to Jen now to restabilize. And Jen's already used the catalyst wall, so there's no cover outside of a meager white knockdown shield being used in Lagoon. Somehow, Dark Zero are getting their players back into the game, but it is against all odds with four squads all within 25 meters of them. Wow, look how many teams have already shared some of that space, too. This is what we're expecting. There's four teams, by the way, trying to fight their way into that, uh, that building. As we take a look at Legacy on the other side of Temper, taking this fight, taking onto the height. Digi threat in hand here, too, for Cloaked. Just trying to stop their rotation, but playing off the slight little lip with the circle, closing in right behind their backs. They are safe inside that next circle, but they're looking to take this fight. Legacy coming in from the heavens, putting down the black hole. He gets shut down almost immediately oh, with no. two going down from Temper. Now, I talked to Audi before this match day, and Audi very much recognized and respected pro teams. 
for the length of time that they've been, of course, in the pro league and the smart way in which they fight, not just relying on mechanical talent. Temper, feel that right now. They don't just know it. And all I can say is from Legacy to Temper, Welcome to the Pro League, with Nine Lies coming in right after that to clean up a few kills. Everybody is going to be getting out into what is likely to be a Lagoon ending. Temper, of course, having the initial move on that, but all teams having to move through those that stuck around by launch pad and with very little resources to do so. There aren't a whole lot of crafters if you haven't come from Pylon, and that means that squads should be running low on resources. What in the chaos is this circle here? We're looking at FaZe, but right before this angle, they had taken a fight versus Moise, who, by the way, Guild did get his teammates up at some point and found their way to take care of Disguise. FaZe on a terror, putting themselves on the board. AKP in total for this entire squad. They are feasting right now while going for the reset. Phase's use of the cat wall there means that it's not going to be up for the next zone close, which is happening in 15 seconds. This is big, and it could be the biggest missed call from Phase should they go down. They are going to have very little effective cover to work with, especially now that they used a smoke on top of it. Watch Phase. Keep your eyes on the kill feed because they've got a journey to go and no cover to do it with when they approach the next zone. The Meat Lovers still playing on the edge with Nine Lies playing on the south side, but they have their sights onto Ape Gang and Temper that are making that rotate over by the south side. Phase losing out on Panders. The gravity lift right in front of Snipe, though, having to be careful, finding Void, getting that first knock. He tries to get the finishing blow, but with the circle closing it, it is too much pressure. This is a circle that will make you cry. Meat Lovers waiting on the other side to try to gatekeep, but there's a squad that's right behind them. Unfortunately, angled out in way too many ways. Smokes both on cooldowns means that meat lovers have to play around the rocks, much like Sentinels were earlier, but without the setup. A1's still trying to hit some flesh heals while Luxford struggles on the low ground. What on earth to do when the team is scattered like this, when you are beset on all sides? Luxford's finally get the chance, gonna get the chance to hit a bat. It almost gets canceled by his untimely demise. But now, with the alternator in hand, Disruptors no less. He's thinking about committing onto the recent demise of Ape Gang. Nine lies take another 3v3, bringing from the preseason qualifier, their ability to frag out the meat lovers commit, but again, chewed through by nine lies. Even moisture looking at this. Can they survive the nine lies? Again, I mean, it looks like they themselves have had nine lives with the uh, just insane game that they've had to push through for today. Guild's down. Guild going down and MT popping the Phoenix. He is able to reset while Waltzy provides some additional cover. He stops the reset from happening. No res in his zone, leaving nine lives. Literally one. He gets the knock with the melee. It's only up to MT to come in and close out that fine finishing blow onto nine lives. But the squad oh, behind no. him won't let him. They're empty. Moist get wrapped around. It's Crane that shoots them in the back. MT still putting out respectable damage as he gets collapsed on, but it is Nine Lives that outlast them again. Nine Lives who are still waiting for their chance to reset. We'll see and they were if they right can survive up against Cream. They were right behind Cream when that was all happening. They all focused fire that last member of Moist. So Cream now taking that fight versus Nine Lives. Let's jump into that listening with Set Nose while the Kraber is in RKN's hand. They just ate a fat nade inside. 140 on bang in the window. 140 on bang nice, in nice. the window. They're getting pushed inside. They're getting pushed. They're getting pushed. They're jumping on left. Jumping on left. Crack hat. Crack hat. Crack hat. They're jumping out. They're jumping out. They're jumping out. 42 on bang. 42. Push, push, push. Yeah, knocked, knocked, knocked. They can't they that one. I'm not. I'm saving my nades. I'm saving my nades for, for cannon. I'm walking up. I'm walking up playing cannon right here. We can peek. We can peek. I'm peeking the wall. I'm holding right, holding right with Kraber. In front of me. Care height, care height. 140 under, 140 under. Crack one on height. Just a hard focus seems on the left. I don't know if there's someone on my right. I think there is. There's a solo somewhere as well. Okay. Solo or two duos? Does this wall's gonna go down and they're gonna be in this cubby? They're, they're, they're safe, they're safe, they're safe. How the fuck? Close right, close right, in the smoke, literally in the smoke. I just hit a big nade, I just hit a big nade, 100 damage. Underneath, we have angles right here. There's a whole tournament underneath, I think, guys. I have this much I think He's right here, crouching in a corner. Do you guys have nades? No. No, no, no. Oh my gosh, I'm being fucking focused from height. So, so 
So all, all we have is a solo to our right. You can have cat wall? Yes, I have it. I have it. Still have hey. it, bro. That might be the solo to the left. No, th this is a full three man. This is a full three man. We have to hard watch yeah, them. Someone bats. has to look Does anyone right. need a bat? I dropped he two. Bang he bang ulted. He bang ulted. He bang ulted. Crack them. They're, they're swinging out. 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 They're swinging out.
I'm glad we got to see that again because <laughs> a 10 kill performance is somehow slightly less impressive than the way that he navigated in the end ring, even whipping out the melee to secure the W for the team. Sentinels do place respectively, however, with eight kills. And as you said, a lot of pop-offs individually to secure that. A little further down, nine lies with their seven kills, put up a 10 point game, effectively placing them third in points during the lobby. Even looking all the way down, we saw what was going on with the chaos over to the south side by Apegan Meat Lovers. Moist still getting seventh place, even with a rough start. My questions, though, remain around Disguised. Optic Gaming, Complexity, who had a pretty strong first two games now, over on the 18th placement for that final game on Storm Point. Furia 2, a team that we were looking at alongside FaZe, who did, definitely performed with eight kills. But these are the teams that we usually see on that top 10 side of things, having a bit of trouble with their rotations. That's very true, and I think that that's the case for a lot of our teams that we're seeing in these bottom five, especially the repeat offenders, just not quite able to make it physically into the ring. And these rings have been punishing, especially to late entrance. We're not getting anything like Cascade with a lot of buildings, a lot of different ways to approach it. We're getting Lagoon and Echo that really require that you either be in buildings or be punished by having essentially no cover playing out interestingly very similar to how we'll see the games go once we transition to world's edge yeah, I can't wait to see how this is going to go down as we bring Rain Day back. Rain Day, I know you were watching all of the action. I want to hear some of your thoughts. A bit of a southern circle, but at least it was an Echo HQ. Yeah, I, I always, you know, I take these things and say, what can you learn from them versus kind of cursing the results? Because it is random. I mean, it's RNG. That's a BR. We know it when we watch it. We set up to analyze it. We can we could plan everything. And, and one domino is out of place. The whole thing doesn't fall. So I think having Echo back to back was kind of cool. I, I like seeing how these teams adapted. I liked it actually exposing a few teams and that super south rotate and how they just don't have it figured out yet. That's certainly something they'll go back to the drawing board on. And this kind of leads us to where so much of, I think, the dynamic of Apex has shifted. An early game where players were often their own coaches bringing in these tactics that they weren't knowing. They were still experimenting. New legends were being brought in. New maps were being introduced. We don't even play on Kings Canyon anymore. But now as it's become more stable and, and RNG has become mitigated as much as possible, we've seen not just the players, but additional voices matter and make an impact. And, and whether it's Exet and Hodzik or whether it's someone like TSM Raven who happens to be joining us right now for our halftime recap. We get a chance to take a look into the coach's mind. And uh, Raven, thanks for taking the time to hang out with us today, man. How's it going? It, it's going great. You know, I, I have a question to kick this off. I know Dia and Vicky, they might jump a little bit more meta in with you before we look at those zones. But as a coach, uh, do you consider yourself a little bit more of like a Pep Guardiola or like an Arsene Wenger? You know, because I know you're an Arsenal fan. And, and I got to know, I got to know what type of coach do you see yourself as? What do you do for your team? Come on. You know, that's a little messed up. I'm an Arsene <laughs> fan, so I got to support Arsene Wenger, but like, I, I have to respect Guardiola. You know what I mean? He's a strategical genius. Yep. So I'm a little bit of a fan. You could say, yeah. Uh... All right, Raven, I have to ask you the hard-hitting questions right now because I, I know that you've had a lot of eyes on you after this recent re week and talking about the meta and the different legend compositions that we've been seeing in the Pro League. I want you to highlight a few things about the different comps that we've already witnessed across multiple different regions. We've even had Revenant in APAC at one point. It's been absolutely crazy, Newcastle. Um, what are your thoughts right now with Conduit? Has it changed or have you been seeing things develop differently? Differently that allows certain teams to play in their own play style that elevates where their strengths are? Well, yeah, it's, it's definitely a hot topic, right? Like, how good is Conduit? Who's going to play her and whatnot? But, I mean, I think we're going to stick with the horizon. You have seen some teams get success with the, the Conduit, sure. But I will say not every team is as good as Dark Zero. So they can't really... They can't necessarily just copy their comp or copy other people's comps and expect to do just as well. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, Horizon is pretty good against Conduit because I can just queue over, we can just queue over Conduit ult. So if anything, I'm happy about all Conduits. Now, other question for you, because 
I know that at Champs, you and I talked about the Watson and sort of her emergence as an answer to Horizon. We saw that creep in a sure. little bit with Sentinels, but with a lot of teams giving up Horizon, what is Watson's actual value in your eyes right now? Well, Watson is a phenomenal character. However, right now she is bugged. So that, that's pretty unfortunate, but her wall can like heal people through walls right now. Um, without like direct line of sight, and the problem is you can just like heal the enemies, right? But otherwise, I mean, Watson is a fantastic character. Before that bug, she had the ability to eat Horizon ult, eat nades, eat bang ult, really be able to help your team um, hold the space and not have to leave it when you're getting pushed. Just being able to stand your ground. Obviously, she also gave you burst healing too, right? So conduits not just the only healer in the game, there's also Watson. She's giving you burst healing, especially if you pop cells alongside it. But yeah, I think some teams did decide to drop her because of the bug. However, there are some teams actually seeing a lot of success with Watson in other regions. They still are deciding to play the character regardless of the bug. And it seems to be still um, functioning pro like just quite fine. I think for our play style, which is more of like and uh, uh, slam Watson, where you're just coming in late to zone, that bug impacts us more than more than just like zone Watsons. Because zone Watsons really benefit also from the healing they're getting over the course of the game. Um, on edge, not so much. But so that's why personally we decided to switch away from it. But yeah, I love Watson. My hey man. favorite. If, if you give Watson. us any more free information, we're gonna have to start charging for the broadcast. So you know, we got We got to stop you there and get us going into the final circles. Because man, you can tell it, it, it literally can go on and on. The theory crafting is what's made you and TSM so successful. I know you haven't seen all of these, but can you kind of do your best thoughts as on a fly? You know, give us some analysis on kind of how these circles play out. Just watching them fresh, because we saw early. Obviously, this one between Moist and Dark Zero. Moist having a good game coming out in game one. What, what were your thoughts on kind of looking at how this shapes up? Yeah, sure. So Moist does land at this POI. Um, but the really fun, exciting part of ends on this in this POI is they're so layered. You can have so many teams playing on the low ground and sort of duking it out for that final Horizon Q or Evac Tire up, right? And they're completely out of LOS of the other teams in Echo. Um, even the height and everything. So there's th these really fun games that are going around, like low ground, high ground, and teams fighting for these positions. I think too, when you talk uh, about this, we had back-to-backs. This is obviously like game number one. We're gonna see a very similar circle, although it plays pretty differently pacing-wise. We had kind of seen it end right on that edge. Now it crawls a little bit, uh, I guess, n north or, or west of the original ending. And, you know, how, how do you take an Echo fight? And more importantly, the teams that aren't really getting to these fights and, and having a hard time, how would you go back as a coach and look at that? If Let's say two bad zones for you, two Echoes, and you just basically very, get very little points. How would you go and look at that and what adjustments might you make? Well, Echo is one of the easiest zones to get into in the game. There's a million spots. Like I was talking about the low ground, there's all these um, really accessible spots that you can get to out of LOS of everyone just based on how, just because of how the terrain is designed. So there is a rotate that you can find into this POI from pretty much every direction. You just have to look around in the POI and really get those micro rotates down. Now, Furia, they've been a team that, you know, we had seen before. I, I think they gave you guys a run for your money over a year ago, and it was a fun time when it, the meta kind of started becoming so aggressive after being very, very stale in terms of defensive legends dominating. But Furia, with this squad, Madness, his Watson, Keon, how are you feeling about this group together after especially an explosive Game 2 win that we saw? Oh, they're crazy good. I love this combo so much. Um, I'm rooting for them. They're my boys. They're all ta really talented players, and like, there's there's no way to me that they don't make land. Um, so mm. I think very highly of them. But yeah, the fact that they won also this last game in Echo HQ from Wall, using those low ground rotates out of LOS of everyone, um, was really fun. It's it's a blast to watch. 
All right, now I think just for me and, and for everyone watching this, it was kind of a clear uh, moment. Sentinels, they ended up using a lot of the value from just this position to go ahead and kind of party the third party this and go into the fight. They didn't end up closing it out. It was PLP. But in general, we've talked so much about the meta. You've mentioned Conduit. If there's a legend out there that you think might come back into it, you know, whether it's Bloodhound, which we're seeing a spattering of in North America, a little bit more maybe in EMEA. Uh, Mandy mentioned bringing Gibby back for his squad next week or the next time that they play. You got your eyes on any of those in terms of could start to play an impact later on in the split? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but I will say that Gibby is a few nerfs and buffs across the board um, to being meta, for sure. Like, he, he mm -hmm. operates a very similar role to Watson and Horizon and being able to help your team dodge abilities. And, you know, Horizon's been getting nerfed. She could get nerfed again, who knows? So, we'll see. All right, that's a very, that's very cool. I mean, I think a lot of people, Gibby's coming to mind. There's really no shielding in this meta right now. There's different ways of being defensive, but it's all kind of doing it in, in a, a roundabout way versus the standard straight up shielding that we've seen dominate when Gibby was around. This is the overview of the teams. I, I wanna get your thoughts on this before we bring it back to Vicky and Dia. Just, to me, Disguise stands out. I've seen them play so well. Optic Gaming, they're a team that obviously is always deadly. They almost shut down your championship win before if it wasn't for that clash with NRG and, and kind of keeping the tournament going. I mean, who stands out to you right now, good or bad, Raven, looking at where we stand after three? I mean, Disguise is definitely a shock to me. They're. I mean, a talented team. There's definitely a little bit of disarray in the comms and like the vibes uh, when mm. I was watching earlier. So, it, but if they can address that early on right now during this break, especially, they should be good because they have the, they're the type of team to be able to, you know, drop a 20 point game. So otherwise, I mean, that theory, I'm just not surprised. I think they're a great team. All right, well, we are back here. I mean, Raven, you spent some time with us. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, and, uh, you know, I want to make sure, Vicky, if you have any last words, Raven, any last questions, Dia as well, you guys get in there before we say goodbye. For first off, oh, I just want to say that shirt is amazing. <laughs> what, a, what a shirt to wear right now for, oh, you for a very fitting situation here. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, just gotta, you have to, you know, show off the shirt a little bit, but it's been a really fun time talking to you, Raven. I guess just to wrap up and just to get your thoughts really quickly, because I've always wanted to hear about this. What are your thoughts on the teams that perform better on Stormpoint, which has been TSM in the past, versus the teams that perform better on World's Edge? We see that time and time again across all the lobbies that we've covered. Well, at the end of the day, you just need a good POI on both maps. So if you if you really want to compete to be the best and win the whole thing, um, it's not enough to be able to just do well in one map. So there's been also a lot of nerfs and buffs to a lot of different POIs. And at some point, you got you just got to realize when you got to leave. You know what I mean? It was the same thing with us and Well. You just got to leave when the your POI gets nerfed. Well, very tried and true in terms of uh, what you've said and what you've done. It's ended up working out, obviously, talking to our reigning champion coach here, TSM Raven. Thanks for taking the time with us, man, and uh, enjoy. Watch party or whatever you're doing, and we'll see you uh, in the Pro League very soon. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Always good to chat with Raven. Uh, very, very fun. We got these games starting as well. Before we just jump straight into it, though, do you have any quick reaction to that or just, you know, spending some time with Raven? I, I, I honestly have enjoyed spending time with Raven. It's been difficult to book him for a small preseason meta chat. So <laughs> getting to hear a little bit of uh, what's going on behind the scenes now that TSM is starting to get going, it's good. Well, I, that's why I said we got to shut it down. Otherwise, you're going to have to start charging, man. You're giving up way yeah. too much information. Uh, Dia, take a break, man. Maybe you'll be able to DM him now since he was just on the show. You know, I don't know. Maybe he'll he'll feel nice about it. Uh, we know he's not doing anything exactly right now. Take a break, Dia. And uh, he will be joining us later in uh, five and six for four. It's Vicky and I getting in on the action. Vicky, what a day. Let's kick this off. World's Edge, North America. Uh. We are back at home, World's Edge, game number four, our first game on World's Edge, and I'm excited to take you all through the action with my buddy Rain Day here. I always love to pick Raven's brain about his thoughts on not only the meta, but on the differences in how teams play on both map transitions, because like I said before, we've seen the performance for some of these teams having a much better time on Stormpoint versus World's Edge here, and we actually get to see some fighting off the rip already. Sentinels not able to take a break with Temper right above them. 
I mean, you know, I, I just didn't want to say this looked kind of like how I would jump into a match in World's <laughs> Edge on Fragment. It's certainly lasting longer as well, especially with the Buster Sword that's been in there for a while. But luckily, we don't have that in the ALGS. Uh, and you know what? I don't know if that's luckily. That would be some fun matchups as well. I, I would kind of like to see a duel with a Buster Sword for it all in Apex Pro Esports. But <laughs> neither here nor there, Vicky. Sentinels, though, coming off a good second place finish. Not a win, but a lot of points. They're second overall in the lobby. You know, RKN, Zanile, Oriolis, they're going to feel happy about that. And I can see why the confidence is there. And we believe there's also another 50-50 potentially happening by launch site into Dome here. We may have to save in the feed between Legacy and Over, but while we ski currently Sentinels still trying to find their footing here in Fragment, getting on top of the roof, RKN, being on the Bloodhound here too, by the way. I love to point that out as we talked about the different comps coming into mm. play, but the trade has allowed Sentinels to keep this fight even for right now, but giving up on the high ground. Bit of an issue there, and obviously RKN being the IGL, it is so tough when he goes down first. Temper, though, end up getting aggressive, but then backing off and taking high ground. Cloaked, call spades. They're going to try to do a 3v2. I'm not sure why they can unless they get kind of caught in a little situation like this. Oriolis gets a little bit of damage. Does he have a blue? But look at that rampage. He doesn't miss a bullet. And there's maybe no better weapon in the game if you don't miss a bullet. But Zen oh my goodness, is that somehow Zenial? Yes, it is who stays alive, it's not just because of him. It's because Evolution saw an opportunity to evolve in their KP, and they third-partied this. They moved so fast from Monument. They knew that fight was going to go down. That was a 50-50 in the making, waiting to happen. And Moist, who usually shares Overlook and No Name, have already made their quick rotation around where they have Evolution in their sights. Finally getting set nulls, taking them out of the lobbies, and now cannot get away for very long. But man, what a timing for Evolution. I believe they also were probably able to get the ring beacon too that was over by Monument. As we take a look at the southern zone that we have here on World's Edge, moving in between Lava Siphon and Launch Site, this could actually go towards those buildings that are north of Launch Site, right before that zip line that could take you to Lava Siphon. It's going to get pretty congested there, and, and it is Legacy who does land in Launch Site, so they were able to get the information from that ring console well actually taking a look at this vicky it's great to see kind of how condensed this is already getting it's clearly a southern zone we know where that's pulling and this is world's edge this is not storm point it's not echo coming into these new areas that people haven't played and getting adjusted to after ignites season drop this is tried and true and so they know where they want to play they know the ideal rotation paths for this and i, I would like to see uh if we can see some more predictability from some of our top teams i think this is an opportunity too for disguise uh to come in they've not been playing well they've got a lot of uh potential and raven mentioned it it's about figuring things out on the fly if they can just get their comms just get their decision making a little bit better between timmy and design and 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 seeing if they can do this uh i think they can have a chance but uh it, it's gonna be a matter of can they adjust together especially with a new map it's a pretty good opportunity it's all about that mental, too. If your comms are, are a bit crowded and the vibes are a little off there, you have to imagine uh, the tilt that that could put individual players in. And I do know Design is a very passionate player, too, just making sure that the team stays together there while Timmy's an insane fragger in his own way. But having to see how that's going down for Design enemy and such, Disguise, Disguise will be rotating from that north side, but a team that we have had to highlight after their performance in that last game on Stormpoint, PLP, taking the dub over Set Knowles, who came in second, place that knows not even in this lobby anymore but Zainu rotating with the blue evil shield and while they do make this rotate they're taking their time while they go through geyser there is no replicator there i believe but most of these teams over on the east side of the map have already made their rotation into that final circle bony frex and Zainu. Zainu with dark zero the story there is they felt like they needed a change and that change obviously was sykes sykes also changed from exet bringing in Koifel, it's a lot of really deadly damage dealers being swapped. And sometimes you might think, well, why is it that? Like when you look to make a change, oftentimes I feel like a lot of teams would think, well, it's time to make a change to the character of our squad, like how we overall are. But a lot of teams in Apex, they just kind of switch off the exact same role, but with a different player. You know, Koifel, I mean, even if you include Amiya, you look at Effect, you look at uh, Zainu, you look at Koifel, you look at Sykes, they play very similar roles for their squad. They're great controller players who dominate when given an opportunity in 1v1s. 
maybe sometimes it's just personality that's the right fit and, and in gaming and in apex you know how big of a deal that is when you have the right vibes vicky i mean it doesn't sound very educated yeah. but it's kind of true it's like sometimes the vibes are high and that is the difference into why you would go with one player or not it's super important it's synergy that all comes down to the synergy that your entire team has and knowing when to follow up and understanding and trusting the individual players on your team plp has been taking the long way around into that next circle but they are neighbored right alongside over sleepers who probably saw plp and have made the rotation out of big mod naturally they will have better loot to work with and you can already see they have the advantage with those evil shields a cat wall has been called in from landslide and that is exit that is on the high ground from landslide as they do have the replicator available to them we do know that the sculpture is in the replicator as well as a purple stock but koi doesn't even need it he's taking some of these shots with the 30 30 finding his first crack very very good weapon right now very efficient that 57 42 you're breaking a shield most of the time if you hit a couple of those it's a tough weapon to get it down from from that range and not that you could play much off of it g7 i think when that was a little more meta had just that explosive nature of pop 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 and you're almost hitting what feels like oh, i'm dead before i know it 30 30 though so consistent really good up close and i think just blends wait, in well with wait 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 currency. wait they didn't know no way that i did the fact that this guy's was still there like three minutes later is crazy waiting for one team any team to fall right into the fly trap design getting the knock they get the following knock kareem get eliminated as they were running away from exit and fall into disguised hands are you kidding me that's just not right <laughs> That's just not right. Wait, wait are on, they going me. back to the same truck just to wait again? Oh, you're going to do it crazy. again? <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The next team, only team who could possibly have that happen to them, though, would be Xset. And I don't anticipate Xset falling for that one. Dark Zero in the middle of a big fight, though. That's a piercing Spikes headshot. Of course, that's not going to do much for Dark Zero and Spikes finding a way, but these could. One, oh two, God. three. Four would have sent them home. There it is. That's the fourth. Uh, Wope will go down. Nine lives inside the container. Nowhere to go. Dark Zero just saying it's a matter of time before we get in there, especially with 94 bullets left in that wingman from Sykes. I don't know, though, Vicky. Do you think this is worth enough? Kind of trying to go into it, or are they putting themselves at a risk of getting third partied here? We were talking about how many teams have already made their way into where they predict that final circle is going to be. And this is a very risky fight because you have to also imagine the line of sight that teams have on you from Lava Siphon. I know right behind where uh, Dark Zero is to their north, Meat Lovers is right there. As you can see right here, Meat right. with Tech getting that scan. But they're backing away because they also cannot give up this spot. They overextended and they lose out on their cat right when they were trying to take some shots at the team that is north side of launch side. That believe that maybe Legacy was able to get that knock. Dark Zero though do end up taking over the territory. Meet on the other side of the wall. Teams behind them and the smokes around them. And 14 teams beside them. As we can see now that as we head over to the southern side of our map and it pulling in, the skies are rotating around tree, Eternal rotating around stacks, formerly in Fragment, shifted a few seasons ago now to eastern side of the map, and they could run into Oversleepers right now, though on the other side of it is Phase. Eternal going to climb as high as they can. They've got to go through tunnels or they have to fly over, and they're going to elect to fly, skip through Geyser, and hopefully land in front of oversleepers who are going to be taking the exact same route just on the ground to get to where eternal just landed they get a couple of shots and it's just about maybe throwing this wall just to try to survive oh. doesn't even get a chance can't even look in the wrong direction immediately gets pinged by a bunch of 30 30s on this rotate they took the hill mary evac out of there and they are paying for it right in the line of sight of optic who are looking to capitalize wingman in hand dropped on the other side with a g7 but they also don't want to give up this corner because they know that there's probably a team right below them i believe that may have been phase that had taken control over the buildings right next to the geyser by this spot in the platform but ec somehow are still alive looking to try to get the reset at least as a duo 
carrying around those mobile respawn beacons, I just feel like has been something maybe teams haven't talked about much. You know, you obviously have the evac towers and for good reason rotations you never know when that's going to be just a distraction it's going to be life or death over respawn beacons though sometimes take the backside of it and with this tight of a circle even though there's still 15 squads left there's not a lot of ways to get a respawn so they might just have to play with two snipe down the one who was giving them that courtesy knock that made things difficult beautiful radiant transfer snipe down was getting low is going to now hit the phoenix kit cover those shields for real as pander smokes their left side and Zeratrick, he's still on a white, gives you the information that you need. They have not done much this game except stay where they are and trying to play for zone, but it has not worked as they are getting peppered from all over. And Charmander and Vod trying wow. to take at least one down, and I think they will. They clean them up. FaZe gets eliminated, and that push, too, with the Cowl is exactly why you did not see Optic Gaming leave that exact area on the platform to try to go for a dirty on the team that they were originally pressuring. Good job on them, and with FaZe now out, over sleepers get even more KP, and they're going to be able to hold this side for now. They, I know that it, it is going to be clear for them, but if they do try to approach that next circle, pulling towards launch site... They will be out in the open for teams on the south side of launch site and in front of Eternal to take some, some shots at them. Mm. They've got a bit of a dilemma, but I'd rather be them than FaZe, who've just gone out yeah. in 15th. <laughs> That's kind of the risk you take, obviously trying to hold zones so early. Doesn't really make sense to run around the map and obviously try to loot when you know zone's going to end up there. Running into teams or just going away from a place you know you're going to end up but sometimes that's the way the cookie crumbles they played oh placement just did not work nocturnal wow escaping with a sliver of health he should be able to get a phoenix kit off there or at least a battery coin nearby and darks are on the outskirts mm. knock definitely felt that one literally was one was able oh, to yeah. set right here and you saw the stream of the 30 30 bullets just giving him a haircut in every direction <laughs> especially now playing this out as a duo losing out on fun i only see an evac in their hand don't think they're carrying any mobies for right now as it is in the replicator as it made the switch today dark zero though even though they were in the middle they're playing off this low ground here i believe when they did do this rotate they may have wanted to try to play for that truck originally because they knew that there was already teams on the high ground they get that dirty onto the player that's knocked right before their eyes no resets allowed and playing off this low ground could also be risky for the teams that will be filtering out of lava siphon well moist goes down there one of our contenders i think sitting fourth overall today disguise still holding a 20th position timmy trying to get his squad back together in the shape that they were expected to be in. It's a uh, number one hold still for PLP, winners of our last game. And that's huge for a squad like Zainu and Frex and Phony. Frex and Phony representing FaZe no longer with that team. Snipe down still holding down the fort there. Designful trying, but Disguise just haven't got it done. They run into Complexity, who have been firing on all cylinders today, and they will continue to move into sixth place now, tied for fifth with Dark Zero. Monsoon just went crazy with the Sentinel there for that fight, too. Absolutely feeling yourself exiting out of that fight, having Red Evo, and now navigating onto that other side of launch site while maintaining themselves in that final circle. This circle will be pulling towards exactly the building that we just saw Complexity fighting disguised in after they had taken them down. Elevate, though, coming in from the low ground with some of these 30-30 shots, leaving that player literally one. It's going to be Zach now tending out the bang ult as he is able to move over to the right side. This is going to clear up some space for them to make this rotation. It is amazing what can happen with one fight. One fight can change the pace, change the future for your squad in games like this. Game two, they were so close to being in the spot that Furia ultimately took from them and then took into a winning position to take the game and get into our top five. Elevate now sitting on nine points, just making it 10 as they're trying to get into the top 10 and get back to a place of potentially leading this lobby. They have an uphill battle physically emotionally and literally but you've got to say they can do it they just have to win these fights right here and that is a good start they go from 11th to 8th here at least gain a few more points they take down evolution vicky leaving them with just one wing on their death box before shuby now makes the rotate around this cat wall and before they see the team that's right across from them we also said goodbye to ape gang in the feed the only team by the way running the rampart which is crazy they ran rampart for the second Another time one. and meet lovers meet them right back in the lobby but this is amazing for e8 right now 
this is a big game for them. I mean, this is really what could have happened had they not run into Fury. And now, you know what? They're not going to have to. The only thing they have to do is worry about playing in front of them, which is a good problem to have, but in the same way, that means they can't go backwards. They must go forwards. The only path forward is through, and Legacy know it. Yanya, Niazul, and Jaguares, I, this is the squad I wouldn't want to have to fight in this situation, but at least Elevate know there's no real other chance. 22 seconds left before the zone starts to push in Vicky. Legacy still holding in, knowing they might have to move too, not wanting to get caught off in a fight that maybe could turn their backs on a team trying to go and third party them. And Legacy has always been a team where they always come out on top for circles that pull towards their POI over at Launch Night. They take advantage of the blessings when it comes to these final circles, but now it's having to fight off his team over to the other side, avoiding that nade for right now. Nizul's trying to take a different off angle, kind of bundled up behind the same little head glitch Ooh. here, but not trying to expose too much. Catalyst wall goes down from you, Jaguares. He's got the Sentinel as well. Ooh. But Zach Mazer with the wingman. It's one. It's 32 and flesh onto another. It should be Shuby and Zap able to clean this one up. I can't believe it. One of our best 3v3 fighting teams goes down. Elevate are elevating themselves as we speak. And now they've got another challenge. It's getting through Optic if they can do so. Dark Zero down below continuing the fight. And we're in our top five. Taking care of oversleepers here. The Kawa only providing a little bit of cover before Zero goes for the quick shield swap. It still isn't enough. They are in the line of sight of complexity. PLP now moving in. Perfect timing from that Catwall Monsoon. Having to go right back inside the building to reset. But the circle also dealing enough damage to allow Lou to come in for the follow-up on the wingman. Destroy these cat bats right in front of them. Get that dirty onto Phony, leaving PLP as a duo. They are right next to Dark Zero, who are playing off the low ground, but this is the same building that we were mentioning before. This is where that middle circle is going to be. MG Lee on the Loba. I love this pick. Not until top five, but guess where they are? This is so good in terms of finding your resources when you can't move. You've got access to anybody's death box who goes down, and you would certainly think there's going to be at least a few squads. You can either grab shield swaps. You can grab all the ammo you need. You will not be in a dire straight situation. Like, you look at Optic. I mean, so rocking with a blue shield this late in the game. Skittle Cakes has not had much to work with. At least they've got a wingman and some really good position. They've just got a hole. They can't be the first one to go into the fight. But it's tough knowing complexity. Maybe they don't know complexity has a lot of resources just to the right of them. They've got to be careful. That door doesn't open and a few arc stars and nades come pouring out their way. Right, they're going to be pinched between complexity and elevate though. And Optic and E8 both need this game desperately looking at where they're standing right now in this lobby over the bottom half of the bottom 10 of the leaderboard, E8. Zach taking too many shots. The wingman mm -hmm. actually getting that knock. It looked like originally, no, they were able Great to actually wall. heal up behind the crate. Yes, beautiful wall to isolate Optic for this fight at the very least. Optic having to play this safe because then if they decide to poke, that's just going to be the green light for either PLP or maybe even Dark Zero if they could get onto the high ground to try to contest them. They need Complexity to make a move. That's the only way Elevate win here because Complexity is the team to the left that splits PLP and Optic. But right now they're inside and they can just focus on Elevate slowly but surely moving in. That seems like a desperate gravity desperate gravity lift and there's an evac tower it's probably just to distract maybe a desperate option if the zone ends that way to go up and get out of sight shuby zap and zach they've stayed alive though vicky Oh, that, that is Dark Zero right there that took the evac tower to get from the low ground right back to the high ground. They got the invite to the party just a little bit late, but Complexity fighting up against Dark Zero. P.O.P. get eliminated as a duo. Dark Zero taking that fight to Complexity, though, to try to grief them while they're inside this building could actually open up opportunities for Optic and Elevate. This is unbelievable. I mean, Optic's still in that little zone. Complexity and Dark Zero, I don't know how they're sharing the space. It's just Sykes. Complexity has refused to come out of that building, and why not? It's guaranteed at least a top four. Certainly about to be a top three. Dark Zero eliminated as well. Optic goes up. They're trying to fight Elevate, but knocked. He gets not knocked. He is still alive. Somehow they've made their way to a top three, but it's not going to be a top one. Complexity finally leaves their house, and it's for a victory only. What a move from Monsoon and Kim G. Lee repping the Loba late game, and it pays off big. And all off of that rotate that they had right over to launch site. That was absolutely huge. They rotated from staging. They took care of Disguise. And they were in the game-winning position inside of that house, waiting for all the teams to come to them. That was a big game for Complexity because they were able to get a good amount of KP at the same time. It really was. I mean, there were so many moments there that 
it could have gone either way had optic pushed had complexity pushed they had a very similar style of play where they were just holding and complexity knew wait a second wait a second here Kim Chi Lee went in the back he stopped doing bicep curls and he said guys hold on we actually don't have to do anything we could force everyone else to move and they did it was easy to see the kills dropping the way to not you know go out there it must have been uh difficult because there were a lot of chances but they stay patient and they get the dub vicky and uh that is all that you can ask optic force to fight elevate who had a good run but i, I like that end zone it's a great start to world's edge yeah, a little bit of deja vu. I've seen that end circle so many times, but it's also beautiful to note with Dark Zero trying to get onto the high ground right there and taking that fight versus Complexity. It was thanks to the fact that PLP as a duo was still present outside of Complexity House to then put in pressure onto Dark Zero and for Complexity to finish off what was left of that team as well as also putting pressure onto PLP. Let's take a look at a few highlights, Rain Day. Walk us through a lot of the action that went down. All right, well, you know how it is. Things get serious when you switch to World's Edge. Everyone knows what this feels like to play here. And Sentinels, they felt it. Coming off a second place against PLP, they were really, really willing to take that early contest. It just did not pay off for them. They lost RK in early. Zanile, he ends up staying alive, but it's only because Voodoo shows up and they're ending uh, 3v3 because they're a third party. The Skies, they play a little trick and Dark Zero, they do a trick of their own they siege a box which seems to be pretty well defended but not not good enough to defend against Sykes wingman play as that leads us kind of towards disguise to Vicky have not had a great day a little surprising but you know Raven alluded to you know maybe there's something else going on trying to get on the right rhythm it is a new team though they obviously have potential to drop 20 bombs Absolutely, especially with the individual players on that game. We saw if can go out earlier on, but Elevate here fighting for their lives on that side of the circle accrued them so much KP to work with. Elevate then fought their way not only from that building, but taking that fight over to Optic before finally they were able to take care of Legacy first before that moment, but it was fighting for this building that had me on the edge of my seat. They had the health advantage tensful. Legacy wasn't really playing with a lot of confidence, unfortunately, but complexity with the Kraber shots from Monsoon if it isn't the Senti, it's got to be the Kraber. And that's a team that's also running the Loba, by the way. So they're probably also able to get that loot without having to overextend or give up that house. I mean, that's the real thing, right? You sometimes look at yourself like we're in a position. There was a lot of wingmans, a lot of really high level legendary type weapons in this fight. But we didn't see Complexity ever worry for any of that. They had plenty of resources. Kim Chi, not because he's you know can't do it he got two kills to assist 440 damage he was helping to gather the resources for that squad the loba pick like i had mentioned a kind of a pocket pick to where if you get it to top five i think of her like a caustic i think loba wins quite often in a top five in a good position because there's just such a huge advantage and such a dearth from the other characters and other players of resources that you've got whether it be nades whether it be ammo forcing you to take awkward paths whether you don't have shield batteries so you can't fight and heal so you just have to all in complexity never had to deal with that they were comfortable and elevate and optic were just fighting a second uh, a game for second place for the most time I love how you highlight that because it shows also the game plan for some of these teams and it's to sit in that final circle positioning and wait for everybody else to go to you while you are sitting pretty as we take a look at the results from that match complexity taking the dub with 9 kp elevate though with 11 kills like you saw in that previous that previous screen with optic gaming following right behind with 9 kp taking a much slower approach they originally were in the house right to the north side of launch so they were waiting to see where that circle was going to be pulling but then following down even Dark Zero playing off that low ground for what seemed like ages and over sleepers were very aggressive on the rotate, also allowing them to get 6kp. Yeah, when you're able to do that, you could see what can result. I mean, it's a decent score for a game that kind of didn't feel like theirs to win. Elevate, though, felt like theirs to win. Uh, Optic felt like they they played a solid game. So did Dark Zero. PLP, again, staying solid. And when you're in the position of being first in the lobby, you don't have to do anything else but get six to ten points a game. If you can do that, you're probably going to stay winning this lobby. And if not, you'll at least stay with the top three. You've done so much. Don't waste it on doing this type of situation, which when you look at Furia, you look at Sentinels, two teams that were in the top five coming into it, getting goose eggs and two points. That's the only thing that can hurt you. And obviously they know what they're doing. I'm sure they'll bounce back in five and six, but they've made their lives a lot harder, Vicky. 
Yeah, especially after we saw the performance on the Storm Point from Vera for that game two that was massive, but now they've been falling behind. On the bottom end of the overall standings, they gotta really pick things up. They're slowly gonna deter, defer from the top end of the leaderboards all the way to the bottom. They were in third, I believe, before this game, and even looking at Moist, who fell right before Disguise with no KP to their name that game. Well, a lot to discover and think about here as we take a look at the overall standings. Complexity with a win there. Really good win. Take second place. Sentinels only two points, but because of how well they played overall, they're still in third. It kind of reminds us of UAIM. They got a lot of their points on Storm Point. They basically got six over the course of these last, you know, three games in World's Edge, Vicky, but it still worked out for them. Furia, Dark Zero, Moist, Elevate. I, I think these teams, alongside probably Xset, they also look like teams that at any moment can have a 17 to 25 point game and kind of steal it. But they're going to have to do it now, and it's A5 and 6. There's no more time left. It's This is like the most hot and cold lobby I've probably have ever seen right now in NA playing out. It's either you have one explosive game or you fall behind and all that hard work at the very beginning on Stormpoint now it just falls underneath your feet. It's crazy to see right now how some of these teams have this inconsistent problem and it does transfer over from one map to another like we've mentioned already before in the past at the start of the broadcast. So I want to see some of these teams find that footing. Is it momentum that they're losing out right here? Is it a miscommunication or are these circles pools not allowing these teams to go for the rotates in the direction that they want well certainly we saved the best for last and if you're an apex fan that means game five and game six coming up to you right after this break we're gonna see which team decides to take matters into their own hands and carve a path to victory here in day number three in the algs Welcome back, everyone. The action continues. Vicky Kitty here. I'm joined with Dia, and we're going to take you guys to the action for game number five. Our second to last game here for the day, where a lot of our squads here, Dia, especially in that middle pack, are so close in numbers. It could be one big game that we're talking about with Rain Day, and that team could just put themselves up in the top three. And top three means quite a bit, because while we're thinking about how teams are performing on the day, our, a lot of our squads are already thinking about their chances much later in the season in terms of who's going to have to play out of the last chance qualifier, who's going to have to go to land. These points that you get, especially as you move up towards the top five, actually come in pretty large numbers. And at first place on any individual day can almost single-handedly put you in land contention. So top spots, as much as it is very early in the season, matter so much to these teams. It does, and it also highlights the different types of compositions that we've witnessed from a lot of these teams. We just saw Complexity take the last game, and they were rocking the Lobo, where a lot of members of that team also had a wingman. We saw Kraber in Monsoon's hands. That allows them to sit for that final circle positioning while also not denying themselves the loot from being patient in making those rotations. Aside from that, we had a little bit of Raven's thoughts on Conduit versus Horizon and how that helps out certain teams in the way that they want to approach the Catalyst meta, because that's really 
like we've been seeing right here. A lot of visual clutter between the wall and the Bangalore smokes to allow a lot of these teams to either have a free range into making sure that they can mark down a team that is out in the open without putting themselves in a very vulnerable position or if it comes to a more defensive option where you may see a conduit ult where teams are trying to get away or actually reset inside a house but Horizon Q could easily allow you to get over not just the conduit ult but the catalyst wall as well. You know, there's a funny thing going on here with Loba, and I believe we've got a second so we can talk about this just a bit more because Loba, like you're talking about, is providing a lot of value in late games, a lot of safety, but Loba also on World's Edge matters a lot. There's, as we talked about earlier, lower loot density on World's Edge, which means that it's harder for you to get all of the loot that you would like, be it shields, be it attachments, whatever you're looking for. Loba, of course, solves that problem, but on World's Edge also allows you access to vaults and the care packages that you were talking about, Vicky, let alone evac towers that Loba finds easy to gather and nades in the late game. It makes her this do-everything pick on World's Edge that also solves a fundamental problem of the map for a lot of teams. The interesting thing about that is that while Loba is good, Loba's only as good as how little she's present in the lobby. She's kind of like a Gibraltar in that <laughs> way. If there are less Lobas, she's better. Reminds me of uh, the Lobos that I witnessed in my team. They were always the first ones to get out of a fight without involving themselves too much, but it's about being safe, I guess, when they have the bracelets. <laughs> Did I just trigger something? I just triggered something. Could, yeah. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be me. Uh-huh, for uh. sure. <laughs> but, you know, another legend composition, while we have the time to talk about this, aside from the Loba, that we, the only one that we see in the lobby being complexity, I believe, um, are the few bloodhounds that we were also seeing as we move on to World Edge. RKN coming to mind. I believe there was another Bloodhound that we saw earlier from Cream as well as Eternal. So we also have some Bloodhound making an appearance like we saw in EMEA now making their way into NA. And you have to imagine with so many Banglers, I believe in the first match we were able to get the Legend pick rates. Bangalore was picked 100%. Every team had a Bangalore on their squad. So what do you do around that when you don't really have the information and there is no cat wall? Well, at least you could get the information from the Bloodhound scans when you don't have a Digi available to you. And, and that is really nice, especially because it lets you run things like ARs as a, as a promising secondary and not have to opt into an SMG. So for RKN who wants to play a little bit more like an anchor for the team, he's not entering a lot of team fights first and trying to frag out. He gets to play longer range with a Bloodhound while also benefiting from the inherent digital threat that Bloodhound has while in Beast of the Hunt. It's a really interesting combination because it allows a totally different weapon class to enter the late game where Bangalore is typically present. But on the whole, Vicky, I can't say that I'm a fan of Bloodhound, especially on World's Edge, and even more so for Sentinels, who are so zone-reliant that I think they're giving up a lot of other value they could get for what is ultimately just, as we've discussed, a digital threat. This brings me all the way back to when we first witnessed his Watson on Furio really take out the Bangalore out in these lobbies and utilize Bangalore before we got to see her be popularized by other squads. And Furia had started off the day really strong, but have now slightly fallen off. But when we talk about strong, we're talking about the damage input. Yes, they're very inconsistent, but they have been dealing the most damage out here in this entire lobby. Look how Furia has been able to perform right on top of Dark Zero. This is, by the way, leading into today. This is not not the updated graphic for the events that we've had go down all the way up into this last game. But the highlights that we get to witness from Fury all stem from Stormpoint, basically, where it has been rather inconsistent from Stormpoint, that last game on Stormpoint, and then that la that first game on World's Edge. And, of course, a little bit of variation in between maps, but it is neat to see, and even Raven was excited about it, seeing this team succeed in the way that they have this season. We even spoke about it at the start of the broadcast with the three different stories all coming together and the Keon Watson love that's existed ever since their ranked days together. Now Furia have such a high damage differential in large part because they're being really smart about their fights. A lot of teams will play losing positions and hope that they can win the game. And while sometimes it works, for Furia, they almost never opt into that. If they're gonna die, they die very, very quickly. And if not, they're probably in a much better position than you are. It's literally explosive out here. They're either taking the fight confidently and winning or they get absolutely obliterated. But when we highlighted Furia, this is a team that definitely likes to take their fights, a very hyper-aggressive team. But 
these placement points are not doing it for them. We have to see how they do while we get set up for game number five, Dio. While we take a look at the map rotation, guys, we are finally ready to go. We had a different winner for each of these games, a little different look compared to Amiya. We had two squads dominating the region. We are moving on to World's Edge. Remember, World's Edge for these final last two games for these teams to take the trophy home. And we've already had one ring that pulls us pretty darn far south. Last time we were in North America, just yesterday, however, we ended up getting treated to a Sky West zone. With so much variety on World's Edge and the way that the end games can pan out, we've got a lot to look forward to in terms of how our teams will move in. But that doesn't stop, start just in the late game. We've got early action too. Temper, who have been fighting off drop for especially their World's Edge games in this group, are a likely candidate for some of the early action that we will that we'll expect to see. And as a preseason qualified team, they're one of the most exciting. I love how they've been trying to take this fight too versus Sentinels over by Fragment constantly taking their time but it does open them up for a lot of these third parties and sentinels said that they're giving that up they end up landing in landslide instead all right i'll take it this is you know what a good move from sentinels to avoid the contest at the same time very strange to see sentinels a roster that can perform at this level that has this level of name behind them giving up a contest in order to go landslide instead but arcane's played on a landslide before it's not the last time it's also crazy. They also take advantage of the fact that Ape Gang hasn't been doing too hot. We were talking about different compositions, and Ape Gang is now forced out of their drop spot with very lackluster loot. Look at this. Wi-Fi has got the Mozam, the Havoc. Ape Gang now just running for their lives separately. Everybody scattered, and understandably so. I do expect them to regroup in the next couple of minutes as there's not too much movement throughout World's Edge yet. We do get to look forward, however, to the ring moving over towards them as this does look via the minimap to be a slightly more northwestern sided ring. And we even get confirmation now with the big map coming up. An idea of how everyone will be approaching this game as Ape converge onto Landslide and ultimately should be moving over into a nice spot at countdown and we're moving over to the north side here to close the countdown very similar look to what we had seen before here as complexity now wastes no time on their rotate already finding themselves close to lava fisher with dark zero trailing behind but nine lies already trying to take their fights over to the north side looks like ea are looking to also get involved there's three teams fighting over on that north side my sentinels got here very very wow. quickly and like you mentioned, E8 waste no time, even rocking up to the door and throwing a nade immediately. Watson fences make this all the more difficult to push, but Zach groups up with the rest of the team. Do they actually go for this right now? Or with the Watson fences perhaps disengaging and finding a better spot to play for the late game could be beneficial. The fact that EA also lands in Countdown, already making their way over, and Sentinels still beat them to this POI is incredible now. Taking a look at Nine Lies, taking some shots with that 30-30 here. Gets that crack and the knock on top of Shuby. Now trying to go in for the follow-up. Trying to also keep in mind that the horizon is incredibly low, so not trying to overextend here. Laser doesn't push it too much. Dynasty, however, going to hover for the backup on their teammate, Awope. Should be getting a med kit off in the next couple of seconds, but nobody really pushing the envelope in the early game because so many teams have decided that this is likely to be a Fisher zone. And what a treat, Vicky. Fisher zones are so exciting, especially with Horizon as present as she is. The ability to get from high to low ground equalizes a lot of Lava Fisher zones and makes this an even more stacked POI to get teams into. Even interesting, if you don't have the Horizon, you have to think about those evac towers that could come into play like we saw in the last game with Dark Zero elevating themselves from the low to high ground. Still putting themselves in a very risky position, but Legacy are being pressured by the team over by Lava Siphon. Oversleepers are taking some shots at them, preventing them from going on their rotate. They may need to actually wrap behind launch site if they don't feel confident taking this fight. 
One of the problems with Legacy's spot right now is that they don't actually have ring console. They have no good prediction on where the ring is going, and they could have gotten that at Lava Siphon. If they're not going to go through Lava Siphon, they've got to move south and all the way through Thermal, where Disguised should still be looting up on a slow rotate. Disguised have definitely been itching for fights, haven't gotten the 3v3s that they've been looking for. So as Legacy, I would almost rather wait and tank a bit of zone to get the scan in Lava Siphon. Temper in this fight here, right over by the building in Countdown. Having to be careful with their evil shields though. Two whites, one blue, and immediately it's gonna be moist on the high ground. Right on top of another team that's playing from the low ground. It's gonna be Temper who made that rotate. I know Meat Lovers is gonna get involved in this fight very shortly. They had just called in an evac tower from Landside after getting the ring console over there. But with all these other teams that have gotten that scan and the information on where that next circle is gonna be pulling, expect us to get congested very quickly. There's a lot of teams that could coexist here. Radiant Transfer still on cooldown. Gilden isn't going to be able to peek this angle again just yet. And I'd rather not see Moist waste more resources than they have to. Not able to hit the crafting and countdown with no good shields and very few cells. Options are quite limited for them. Or PLP get to take a different approach. A slow approach and a really nice one. Moving through Skyhook late. Skyhook has a crafter, PLP already have great shields. You've got a ring console here, and I love the way that they are slow playing it. And while they also are slow playing it through that north side, I know meat lovers who also are trying to take a very similar rotation, taking their time, will be able to meet them on the edge of where that next circle is. But it's about to fight for that ring console that you mentioned for both of those squads. So we're gonna probably see them fight very shortly here once they cross that distance. PLP considering checking out Trials, seeing what loot may remain there. It's a smart angle for them to take. It's unlikely they get knocked off the zip line, but a risky move nonetheless. Meat Lovers shooting them in the back from Skyhook. We'll see how PLP deal with this, what their plan is over the next few minutes as we jump into a listen in with PLP. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. <clears throat> Guys Can you check back side? Yeah, since they check right. We have one evac, so. Okay, make sure. Uh, that, that one has team still there? Uh, uh, I don't don't see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Alright, just, just stare at them, okay? Like yeah, I'm, look, I'm gonna start looking right. Where does tech land? Zero idea. You know where? No, I don't. Oh, yeah, wait, it's siphon. It's siphon. It should be siphon. It should be siphon. They have blue. Cracked him. There's another team back. Alright, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Catalyst is definitely playing back here by ourselves. How good, how good is Trials right now? Is it like, is this, is good up top? Where? Yeah, it's okay. Like, it's good. We're in? Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I just, just didn't know if like, if we can play. Shit. No, we're in 100%. They're smoking beacon right now. Beacon, beacon. Second, second, shoot it. Bro. Bro, you are not real, bro. I already used my Q. Are you friend? Team evacing east. How many subs do you guys have? <clears throat> I have 10. 12. But I have six uh, bats. Can I get like two from you, funny? I'm, yeah, I'm four, six, or four, five now, one feeding. Do you need bats? Uh, mm, yeah, one bat. One bat's fine. Okay. Right, just be careful that no one takes the same rep we did, okay? Yeah, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been staring. I've only seen a cat, bro. I don't know where their, third is, or their team is. Love the comms that we're hearing right now from PLP. I love the that fact that they're making that next step to see where they're gonna go, but why don't we take a look at Ape Gang who are still alive, and we highlighted them before. The Rampart and the Loba. They had a bit of trouble on their landing. They got contested by Sentinels, but it's the fact that they're here and still alive playing on that low ground. And a nice spot, too, when a lot of teams have predicted that we're going Fisher, Ape Gang making this long regroup over into the bottom building. And with the Loba, as you've mentioned, no less, gives them the opportunity to access all the loot that other people will likely be crafting and or bringing on over to them over the course of the next few minutes. Many teams are dragging their feet as we move towards this end zone, though, because it is a bit of a toss up as to where it goes. Does it move towards the north end where Sentinels set up really early on just next to Countdown? Or are we moving further into the western side of the ring where Cream and Nine Lies have posted themselves? 
during the first couple minutes of the game. That differential is really hard to move through, and there's plenty of space outside of the ring to make use of evac towers. So teams like Disguised, Legacy, Optic as a great example on our screens are the ones that are going a little bit slower so as to avoid making a critical mistake before the game even really truly starts. I'm so happy you brought that up, too, because that's also going to highlight how some of these rotations are going to affect, especially the northern teams. Optic, with this evac, they will be able to get across that other side of the mountain, but I'm thinking of teams like POP and Cream. If they, it does pull towards that north side, it is very out in the open for teams in Countdown to harass you from. So while Optic makes the rotation, look how many 30-30s are lighting up the sky while they try to narrowly avoid it and find a landing right close to Countdown. Evasive action, Optic <laughs> only lose the shields on dropped marvelously and dropped especially with gold is going to be just fine with that situation. They would like to play this a little bit safe. We know that Moist is sitting on top of Optic right now and the smoke from dropped gives them the cover they need to move into this little cubby hole that we've already seen teams play this morning. Not a long spot, but a temporary position for the Optic lads to at least be comfortable with before inevitably they will have to fight to leave Countdown. Wow, Dia, it is moving over to the west. Look at where this next circle is taking us. So many teams over in Lava Fisher trying to wait, play patiently to see where that next circle was going to be pulling. So these teams still don't even have that information if they don't have access to a ring console nearby. But it's the fact that it's pulling so hard to the west that a lot of these teams, I'm thinking Meat Lovers, Eternal, even Xset, this rotation out of Countdown is going to be brutal. I do wonder with Meat Lovers whether they'll clash on, with PLP and Cream on their move in because they're one of the only three teams that are approaching this zone from the north. A lot of squads are in the same boat as FaZe, having to move in from the east and even turning that now into the uh. south. And it is going so wrong as there's too much open space to really make a safe bet of it. Trying to take that leap of faith from FaZe has costed them here. They're hiding inside the truck, only leaving Zara up and alive before Oversleepers tries to collapse on them. But right behind FaZe, it is a legacy looking to clean up the last straggler here for this team to prevent the reset from coming in. But they can't overextend either. Some of these fights have oh. not been taken with confidence. Losing out, Zara still alive, but it's so costful here. It's an expensive fight for Legacy. Yes, they get that last rat, but at the cost of the catalyst while coming up. And the ultimate cooldown now requires likely accelerants in the next couple of minutes as this zone doesn't give you a lot of movement. PLP have in fact rotated in. We asked this question earlier, would they put themselves up against Cream? And now that last squad has to mark their attendance. Will meat lovers be moving in through the north end of this zone as well? Or will they take the eastern route around passing by countdown? Depends on how much pressure there's there, too. You have to imagine Cream having some safety inside the building. POP staying out of their line of sight, too, by the bins over to the northwest side of Lava Fisher. We are tuning into Moist right now, hanging out on the edge of Countdown. They've been here for quite some time, originally hanging out on the high ground right from the east side, trying to see where the squad wants to go right through those vault doors, preventing them as they're forced to rotate right behind them. But they do not want to get pinched between the team inside, which is Temper, and Optic Gaming playing off the low ground from Countdown. And as scary as they must look to other teams, our perspective on Moist is a tough one. Not a lot of loot, running out of bullets now and unable to as of yet take a fight. Moist need an engagement or we're gonna see Guild run out of light ammo before Ring 4 closes. I take this fight with a Digi, looking at Guild's point of view here. See, the conduit ult has been called in as well as the piercing spikes right in front of them. Disguise, by the way, get eliminated in your feeds. Complexity going crazy while Dark Zero also fighting some knocks. But it's this next fight. Once Moist realizes the evil shields that this team is rocking inside, they can get very aggressive with this fight. 30 seconds left. Not a long time to not only take this fight, but then rotate out. Take a look at the minimap in the upper left. That is a long way for Temper and Moist both to go. If they opt into this engagement, they may very well be dooming both squads to a death outside of the ring. Well, they are just waiting for them. They destroy the piercing spikes for right now. I believe there's enough time. You have to put down another one here. Eternal are right behind them. 
But seeing that they may get involved in a fight, this is an easy third party for Eternal to capitalize in, and they immediately send it forward. Finding a knock already onto Temper, that's gonna be the green light for Moise to get involved too. It's now a very uncomfortable sandwich. You've got to imagine Eternal are the ones that are much happier with this, knowing that they have priority on the future rotation and they take what they need and ultimately still prioritize the movement out and into the ring. They've still got a squad to fight and fortunately did not expend the catalyst ultimate that they may have to wow. expend in order to even touch Lava Fisher. What meat lovers are in the most obscure part right now of Lava Fisher, playing off the edge of this beam on the low ground. Moist get eliminated, by the way, after taking an evac tower, finding an opportunity with some distraction from Temper, finding themselves in that fight, all oh, just for Moist to fall into their demise right below Lava Fisher. Exit also on this rotate now, trying to find a way into the next circle, playing off that low ground. They have some time to see where that next circle is pulling, but they know that there's a squad right next to them here in that building. Not a lot of tools for Exet to make their way across either. A fight is necessary, honestly, for Exet to even be able to make it into this far building. Good smokes on the low ground as well as the conduit queue does keep everybody topped up as Optic take the high ground and are going to have to answer this question themselves. How on earth do you move through Lava Fissure and into the western side of the ring? With 13 squads left and Skittles having what looked to be very limited ammunition for his R9, this could be a definite a tough one. And now we get to see in the feed Monsoon going crazy with a bow check. Every single time we see that team taking some picks from afar, it's always with a power weapon. And that is the power of the Loba. See, three teams sharing this too. 13 squads, or rather 12 squads now in this final circle is going to be crazy here. At least in this circle five, that's going to be closing in the next less than 15 seconds. They're trying to see where they want to rotate here with the squad still being right next to them in this building. I feel, I can't help but feel like we're re watching history repeat itself. We saw the exact same thing yeah. in Countdown. No time left. Plenty of teams still on the same building, taking poke fights at each other when ultimately it will doom all of them. Optic, arguably in the safest position, but even they know that after they've stuck around for so long, it is time to get the heck out of Dodge, and they do not know what they're rotating into. Meanwhile, PLP on the other side of this catwalk coming out on top from another fight are incredibly low across the field from complexity by the train tracks on where this final circle is going to be pulling here. But across from them is going to be nine lies. They're too busy, though, with the team trying to fight for their building off to the right side. It's going to be Exet complexity putting down the low ball so that way they can also have some evil shield swaps. It's Optic Gaming who finally move forward. But look at Skittle Kicks and what he's got to work with. 31 bullets in the reserve before having to drop down. I love the positioning from complexity that we saw there. Sitting outside, watching the chaos in this building, the chaos that has nearly cold optic. Dark Zero even almost falling at the hands of this rotation. They get back on their feet, and the journey just gets even harder, now necessitating that everybody move out of this one building. There are only two squads outside this building. The other four are stacked in one wow. house, Vicky. Wow. The teams that have to leave this building, it's going to be a bloodbath, and it's open range here for complexity alongside PLP right across the field from them. It's great to also note these are the two teams that are sitting in first and in second. Lovely overhead of the mini-map right here on your top left screens, but it's going to be insane for the action that's going to happen inside this house once that final circle starts closing in. Kimchi just playing police over here, making sure that nobody makes any illegal movements out towards them. The one thing that Complexity really cannot stop, however, are Catalyst Walls, and they are accessible. I'd say even a juicy target for teams to catwall towards, cutting off sight lines from both the house and Complexity, and taking a bunch of space towards the south end of Fisher. Exet playing on low ground, have the opportunity to pop up in this case. And remember, we talked about this difference between high and low ground being critical for excellent Lava Fisher play. I got the team that also has to elevate themselves from the Lava side of Lava Fisher. Nine lies looking right below them. It's going to be their next move here. Putting down the piercing spikes, though. They see Frex getting that knock onto Zap. He ain't already at a disadvantage, though, from the other side. Seeing what they could do here, calling in the Bang ult. It's going to give them at least some time to work with, but all these teams are going to be coming out. It looks like PLP may be closing in the gap versus Complexity with a catwall. We have to see how they get to reposition with the teams exiting out of the building do. 
It's prompted immediate aggression from Nine Lives to drop a member on the push. Laser goes down in the ring, giving Mastine and Awope nothing to do but wait. These 25 seconds of the cat wall are going to be used instead to reset, to hunker down, to play for placement. Since PLP's cat wall drops and the smokes are the only things separating them, Complexity have a cat wall of their own going. Keeping them out of the sights of PLP, but they cannot overcommit. Keep your eyes on PLP. They can take this game from Complexity. Three squads left. Complexity, PLP, and Nine Lives looking to try to reset, but PLP looking Nine Lives are behind the PLP. Oh, right. They don't even know. They don't even know. They just kind of rotated right behind them. This is crazy. PLP taking this fight against Complexity without knowing. What? They get the first knock. Complexity gets deleted. PLP. Sony roasts complexity this. alive. I cannot Turns believe around, what I just watched. Takes live. I have never seen a three v three that fast in my life, Vicky. That creep of thermite really held into an R nine. What? Phony has done this. Now I suppose two games. One with the wingman. One with the R nine. But when a team is behind you. It should never be possible to finish that, that game as quickly as PLP did. The fact that they not only took that fight as fast as they did when we were talking about Complexity potentially also having the opportunity to go for shield swaps on that black market, it was how quick it happened. Like you mentioned, the Thermite into the R9 combo, but also the Creeping Barrage in a circle that small. You have nowhere to go. You have no cover. That was insane and a beautiful performance by PLP. That was what, Phony's uh, 7kp alone? That was That was beautiful. Where is my policeman, Kimchi, who was supposed to stop all these illegal maneuvers that were just pulled on them? And credit, credit to PLP, pulling a dark zero and using the enemy cat wall against them. Complexity walled themselves off from PLP to make sure that something like this wouldn't happen. And PLP did use that time effectively, making sure that teams like Nine Lies couldn't push up on them. And at the same time, taking space towards complexity It was a very well-deserved victory. I also really liked how PLP set up their own catwall to block off the vision from the teams that had to exit out of the building, further causing even more chaos. Let's take a look at a few highlights that went down in that previous game because it was a lot of action to break down, especially when that second to last circle had, what, 12, 13 squads still alive here? Um, so many teams were able to sit in these small little Lava Fisher houses and even below as we saw Meat Lovers exemplify really early on. But it was a slow game from a lot of teams who chose to take their time rotating into an unpredictable zone. Whether it pulled into the east or west of Lava Fisher was going to be a big determiner and it meant that we had plays like this where Legacy was able to catch FaZe out on a rotation and Moist even got slowed down ultimately to their demise and that of Temper simply by via, I want to say, lack of commitment, but also lack of good options. Yeah, they, they took that evac tower out of there and said they didn't want to go for a rotate, even with the fight happening right here, closer to the southern building of Countdown. Eternal also finding himself in trouble. Set Nose was inside this building from the very beginning. They changed their POI drop, landing right over by Landslide and wasted no time to go to Lava Fisher. Ape Gang, though, also the only team rocking the Rampart. Match stay alive a lot longer than we had seen in the, some of the previous games here, but that was the what, the fight that we saw between Complexity and PLP. Over on the other side, here comes those Catwise coming in and while complexity was cleaning up the teams exiting out of the building it was plp who came to capitalize the creeping barrage coming in the thermite and the circle to their back plp was unfazed that they had a team counter rotate behind them and as much as the last fight held an ungodly amount of damage for plp all of that at once didn't stack up to what Complexity was able to do during the course of the game. It's PLP's positioning and their great end game play that got them as much placement points as it did. But outside of that, Complexity got very close. They didn't clinch second place. That credit went over to Nine Lies, who was sat behind PLP. But the kills are essentially right next door to PLP, and both teams can be extraordinarily proud of what they accomplished in game number five. Especially with the amount of KP that PLP specifically was able to get off of that dub. And that's off of their second dub of the day. They won the last game on store point before we made that transition into World's Edge. So PLP is looking to stay on top with 9 KP, extra placement points, 9 lies still right behind them too. With 1 KP playing a lot slower, but complexity. It's complexity and PLP that I definitely have my eyes on for this lobby.
And Sentinels staying in the conversation for one of our top squads. This may not look as good as they did over on Storm Point, but it is a big improvement over yesterday's games. Let's take a look, however, at 11th through 20th, because this is where the pressure gets dialed up when we look at game number six. Those teams that are sitting outside of the ones that you see on screen right now, that's where you've got to worry quite a bit about what on earth you're going to do to move up the standings as our games continue. Or Thinking game. about teams like even Optic Gaming that had a pretty nice performance in that game number four, but then falling through behind in that game number five, it's again, these inconsistencies, Dia, before we move on to our final game for game number six, what do you think a lot of those bottom end teams need to do differently? It is very inconsistent. Sometimes they have those really good games, but then they falter behind and one of the first teams out. I do think that when we're thinking about what you need to do differently in games five versus six, these require diverse approaches. So my solution to this game likely would have been to have more teams committing to edge rotations. I would have liked to see a lot more squads play out of Mirage and try and evac in late than play out of Countdown and try and evac in late simply to avoid the rush. But in game number six... I do want to see a little bit more chaos, and sometimes this means, like Ape Gang Sentinels, taking fights as you hit the ground. Because those, while they can be your worst enemy, are also sometimes your best chance to put points on the board. Whether it be 50-50s, which I'd like to avoid, but if you can make something a 70-30, if you can plan a rotate that puts you on the high ground as another team is meant to be passing by you, that's probably your best bet for Game 6. Yeah, you have to imagine looking at the bigger picture where these teams already know where they're sitting, even if they're on the bottom end of the leaderboards, getting any sort of KP, even out of desperation, could be a necessity and also a way for those bottom end teams to gain that momentum to have one hell of a last game. So we have to see how that goes out for some of these squads going into this final game on World's Edge, or are they going to play as slow as we've been seeing disguised, actually, where this slower pace hasn't really been working out for the squad? You know, it's funny that we bring up Disguised because going into their their first LAN in, at Champs, people were wondering whether this squad would be able to keep their momentum, as people have talked about, positive and only positive. Because there is a history of, especially uh, with, with design, wanting to sort of tunnel in and needing his IGL to pull him out of that. Well, we aren't listening to their comms right now. What I am curious about is whether a similar thing is happening as has happened in the past and how DSG are going to recover from that. Recovering today, that, that seems a little foregone. I'm very curious what DSG's dynamic is going to be behind the scenes when they're VOD reviewing today, when they're looking at their mistakes and improving for days to come. While we do get set up and we wait out to see what our teams decide to do for this final game, we're going to leave you guys hanging and waiting in anticipation for our final game. Because don't go anywhere on the other side of this break. we got game number six coming to you.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking with us. While we get game number six ready, we want to recap the day so far in North America. It's been one heck of a time. We've been seeing different compositions coming out for some of our different teams. What works best for them and their rotate? It's been also very interesting to see how some of these circles have impacted the teams and their respective POIs, specifically thinking about Echo HQ earlier on on Stormpoint and what we witnessed from Moist from the second game versus the first game that they had a huge gauntlet run. Uh, very true. Moist actually have had quite a good day, even last game, as much as we were looking at them and sort of ragging on the amount of loot that they had. This isn't something that comes down to the team and how they were performing. It's something that they dealt with and were dealing with quite well, even up until their eventual demise. Landing at Overlook, Moist didn't have a lot of time to move into a far eastern zone, and it's probably one of the worst zones for them, as it doesn't really let Moist move through either side of the map and gather things like crafting and beacons, etc. Instead, Instead, incentivizing to move, them to move straight through the middle. So I am wondering whether Moist and their slower World's Edge performance has more to do with the rings than anything else. And hopefully we'll get a zone that does pull a little closer to them to get a different look at Moist in our next game. But I've been a big fan of how they performed so far today. Just like I've been a huge fan looking at the way that PLP and Complexity have consistently stayed on top, I want to specifically highlight PLP being the only team to take two dubs for today. One on Storm Point, where I believe it finished with 10 KP, and another one that, like you just saw right now, on World's Edge with 9 KP. It's that consistency that allows these teams to stay on top, kind of take a bit of a breather, but Complexity have been playing out of their minds, whether it be fighting for the edge of the circle to sit down in that final circle positioning with the Loba, or if they're looking to try to take those fights no matter what, just so that way they could get that extra KP like we've seen in the back. One of the things I really appreciate about, about Complexity is that very rarely am I looking at them and going, oh, you rolled that team because you out mechanic them. A lot of times when we see Complexity like we do here in third place with eight kills, it's because they played smarter than everyone else and had the mechanics to back it up. We talked about that 11th through 20th earlier, and I do want to check in with them to see exactly what we're working with after the course of the last match. Well, Complexity still reign up there. Well, Xset importantly have slotted themselves in, and we've got a lot of redemption stories going on. There's still one more game. Yeah, taking a look at those match five results, we talked a lot about PLP now going all the way down. Phase, disguise, moist. It's always the same case here. Furia, these are individual teams that we know could drop huge numbers, but falling behind on World's Edge. Very unorthodox, honestly, taking a look at how they usually perform on Storm Point versus vice versa. I'm even thinking about Evolution, and I want to see where they're at in the series surprisingly low as well evolution actually had a much better day in their previous match day putting up better scores and ultimately ending 14th now that they're in 19th with only 11 points so far it does still put them in touching distance of a good game and moving up the leaderboards but it's a concerning move for them given the inconsistency they're demonstrating at the end of the second round or first round robin and even looking at this overall standings too for the day with only one game left, PLP have been able to put a slight little gap between themselves and Complexity, but that's easily able to be bridged if Complexity has an amazing last game. Also, even looking all the way to Dark Zero Sentinels, it's still pretty tight within that top four. I would like to highlight any of those teams could have one heck of a game and immediately come out on top as we get set up for our final game of the day, everyone. This is ALGS NA Groups B and C, and we get to see all the action play out. And as we said in EMEA, Vicky, this is where we finish the first round, Robin, and get to solidly say, after the first stage, who are our best teams in North America? Any points you're going to put up in the first part of the season have to be put on now, and it's why I called for those kill-hungry positions, those that abuse teams around you, who, who you now should have a read on after five games together. I also like to highlight here while taking a look at where the circle will be taking us. This actually 
could give justice to disguise if it pulls towards that north choke point of thermal station by that uphill area that leads into mirage Trois, then you're going to be able to take advantage of that choke and deny any other team moving in from the south side i don't know if they have a circle console at the moment and it will be pulling in that direction but at least they have a replicator also nice to note that sentinels is not landing over by landslide instead they do take fragment to themselves it is pretty devastating, however, to note what you just questioned, that disguised for all that this ring is fantastic for them, have no idea <laughs> that the ring is pulling into this area. There may be a good circle read here. Someone undisguised, I'm thinking likely Timmy, could have seen the first ring and called out, hey, it's likely that the zone pulls towards us, but without the information, they cannot be sure, and they may, as a result of a little bit of slow rotate, actually get caught without as good of a spot in ring as they could. Other teams, however, already moving. Ape Gang, hungry for the kills, as we'd illustrated earlier, are taking on nine lies. It's also crazier to note, too, on the outskirts of staging is going to be complexity. We've probably already made that rotation, and they hear this fight happening where Nine Lies losing out on one teammate now playing right behind this boulder. Dynasty having to only pop shield cells, no bats in their favor. I mean, right off the rip, it doesn't really look like they have a lot to work with. At least in this case, currently saw Lazar. He did have the two bats. Bercy looking at him from the high ground, but... This squad definitely has the evil shield advantage in terms of not just that, but also in numbers. So that team is going to be backing away for now. We take a look at other squads making this rotate. Moist already trying to get ahead. And nine lies don't have a conduit. They are one of very few teams that are not choosing to run the new legend. And because of that, they don't have the ability to craft banners. So when we see them abandon their fragger, Awope, they abandon Awope for good. No chance to get that banner back from underneath Ape Gang in Mirage A Trois. Furia making their rotation through. This move should give Designful and DSG the opportunity to evaluate where the ring is going because nobody rotates into Thermal unless they know that the ring is pulling here. Look how quickly so many of these teams are running game here. Furia trying to fly in from the skies to just get denied by Dark Zero that have the high ground of the double building north of Thermal Station. You already know by this point, Disguise didn't go for the quick rotate like what we had mentioned before, Dia, because they didn't know where that circle was going to be pulling. I think this is a notice, though, for them, as seeing how many teams that have already rotated on that choke where that circle will be pulling eventually. The Catwall has been called in by Dark Zero, and Furia are looking to see if they can close in the gap. You can play out of the low ground for a while, should you like, but not a lot of sustain on Furia. They didn't get the chance to hit things like the Crafter, even though it was in Shrey. Instead, choosing to rotate early with the zone knowledge, meaning that they can't take a lot of poke battles. Other teams, however, like Complexity, who land over in staging, should be positioned really well in this game, since they'll have the opportunity, again, with the Loba, to make use of other teams as they funnel in around them. So... Keep your eyes out for complexity, be it in the kill feed or on your screens. Even if they linger over to the side where the three bins are both by the rocks in that choke, they could get themselves out of the line of sight of teams that do want to try to fight for that same exact spot. And playing around that could also allow them to put in some extra pressure onto teams like Dark Zero and Fury without putting themselves out there for them to get shot at. So taking a nice look at the overhead by staging, you see meat lovers inside of that building. I believe Temper is across from them over by those train tracks, but... I do believe that there's also a circle beacon here. Yes, and that is exactly why Meat Lovers is here. They're also going to be able to deny that information from the other teams that didn't have that type of information leaving out of the south side of the circle. With the Bloodhound, Meat Lovers do have good data, but they don't have great autonomy. This is low ground. It's a passive position for the next ring, and Meat Lovers know and likely embrace this putting a lot more onus on their later game performance, their ability to get out of staging, which can be quite difficult should the ring not correct itself and pull here. This is a low percentage pull, but one that meat lovers may be relying on more than their ability to frag out in zones five and six. They're gonna be taking their time here. Not gonna be leaving here anytime soon. Probably waiting to see if they could get another scan on that circle beacon. Taking a look at complexity, though, 
even though this is the team that is running that Loba, like you had mentioned before, Dia, it's going to take some time before they can get anything out of that black market. With teams now making their way over to the north side of Thermal Station, Sentinels taking onto the high ground. They are going to be coming up right behind Oversleepers, and we know exactly where Dark Zero is. Oversleepers actually may find themselves pinched in this situation with Sentinels behind them. They hear the fighting over to the left side. That's the Skies, by the way, still playing on Thermal Station. And starting to get rolling with a full kill now on Vaudery. DSG have KP on the board. Designful does get chunked, but DSG in the best spot to succeed that they have been all day. Need to play together as a team. Finish off over sleepers if they can with Charmander low. Designful swoops in for the kill, collects it, and sends DSG to another point. Beautiful, taking advantage of that bad situation that Aura was in here. Sentinel still holding on to the high ground, but I'm wondering oh how God. this rotation for Disguise is going to go. This is going to be so tricky here for them. Complexity perfectly predict the ring. They're dead center of the next zone. Whether this pulls ultimately right on top of them or not, and it should, this is still a wondrous position. This should be top five easily for complexity. It's going to be highly dependent on their loot, though. We don't know what sort of, sh sort of shields they have, and we don't know what teams are going to encroach and when. What are the complications with huh, complexity's position huh. is that they can be evac towered on from this spot. Well, it can look a little complex here for them. They could at least hang out over to the side and wait to see what their next plan is going to do, especially when it comes to the teams that do decide to collapse. No team wants to, wants to int on the other, especially on this final game and seeing where they may be standing. Let's jump into a listening with complexity to see what their comps are sounding like and what their next move is going to be. They might die there. They're getting naded out. If they do die, we I, I think we pull from the slow ball here. And then we, I mean, yeah, it reaches IV. You can see it. Like, unless they literally die in the back, back corner, it doesn't reach. This really yeah, needs fucking armors, man. No, that's alright. We'll get him up. We'll get him up. Don't even worry. I mean, I, I saw Polk right. play this. I want to really do the same thing. 100%. 100%. We're going to be fine. I want to do the same thing we've been trying to do. Let's keep incorporating it. Where can this end? Besides the one yeah. we think. Um, I feel like it can end right here underneath the platform. It can end down here. It can okay. pull back to staging A frame. What's the worst one? The staging A frame. Okay. I love the different that's situations really that they're setting up right there, Dia. Yeah, I, I was just coming out of that going, that's really smart. The way that they're setting up for not even things that they have to do, but based on what other teams may suffer, how can they best adapt it to their game plan and put themselves in a better spot to succeed? Really cool to get an eye on complexity and the fact that they're clearly scouting from teams like Pulverex as well. It's a good fight from Legacy, albeit one that is way, way on the edge of this ring. They pick up kills on phase and now should think about moving themselves into the next ring because honestly, there is not a lot of space in Thermal Station as it is it's going to get more complicated the longer that this goes on and the more meds the legacy are missing. Hopefully they're able to craft enough med kits for them to make this rotation and expect the inevitable with so many teams playing on the edge here too. But that was a fight that Legacy needed to take as well as maybe getting even more information off the ring console that was right there by the tree. Optic Gaming also making the pings as they play off the low ground to see if they want to rotate through Thermo or if they want to take the risk on rotating through the staging side of that next circle. And if they do go through staging, they also have to go through Temper and Moist as well as Nine Lies. Exit on the balloon. I wonder where they're planning on going from here. I suppose anywhere is better than the eastern side of the zone, but landing right next to Disguise certainly puts them in the line of fire, and it still opens them up to shots from above. You've only got two smokes and the longer cooldown on those from Bangalore this season, and coupled with the shorter duration, makes this not a guaranteed spot for Exit, and I like that they keep moving on. Hopefully keeping as many of their meds up as possible. Designfuls drop down, though. That means Designful smells blood. <laughs> They're land them landing right there, too, where we just saw Oversleepers get taken out. Just has me screaming, I'm in danger. But Exit will be playing off that low ground right next to the Skies, who aren't going to overextend just yet here, with Furia also taking a look at them. And look at this next circle, slightly pulling away from Complexity over to the south side, but favoring Dark Zero while Meat Lovers find themselves in this fight. Tech still has that white evil shield. Maybe went for a quick shield swap right here, too, while Lux is going to be able to try to give him 
some cover to see if they can try to get a res here. Gets the scan to know exactly what's happening from the inside. Tries to control some more space with these nades. They don't want to let this reset happen here, so Temper's going to come out of the building. Cloaked does drop. Luxford doing what he can to protect Tech, but ultimately a ones gets full thirsted and is now just a shield swap for Luxford, who gets taken down immediately afterwards. It's all up to Tech to protect his team, to get them back into the game. Hits another scan, one that was misleading earlier, thinking that meat lovers might be able to get a res. Audi versus Tech. IGL versus IGL. PSQ versus Pro League the fact that they're playing off this low ground though in this 1v1 and they're also getting shot at from a distance from i believe it could be moist there's two teams off to the side looking to go in for a third party and the longer that this fight goes on for the more risky that they're in they find each other right in the bottom between all the smoke here adi's just trying to find a different angle with the pk but he gets burned right as he's forced to get away oh Gets hit in the back with the catalyst spikes as well. Tech's still alive, but Tech's not pushing this. Doesn't want to overextend into Audi, who is honestly putting all of the movement tech to use right now, simply to survive. With a smoke out, Audi knows that he's got a secured 1v1 up against Tech for just a few more seconds. Peacekeeper out, can clinch this at any time. One good shot to Tech, but he hits for nine instead. A hundred nearly, but Tech still manages to survive with the shield and all, pulling his teammates back onto their feet. The patient play coming in clutch right there for Tech. I mean, if I saw that PK having the disruptors, I definitely wouldn't want to push onto that either, especially in a situation where you're forced to play up close and personal. Coming in clutch here, they are going to be able to go for the reset, and PLP, our team, leading this lobby in first place with 68 points, looking to make this rotate here from the train tracks. Now, this is where it gets especially complicated because we've gotten the chance to see the ring. We've taken a look at the mini maps that were lying in the upper left, and you know that getting into thermal is the only way into this zone. Moist, know it as well, fighting on the low ground simply to collect KP, not to plan out their future rotate. This is a game of kills for them as evac towers finally come in. Evac towers that are more like prayers in this ring because there is no safe space to land on the opposite end of this. There are oobs available onto Complexity's spot, but with Legacy hitting shots like that, Tech goes down and Legacy may choose to go for the kills instead. So maybe waking up a little too late, but it's too late. Better than never here as new Zul coming in with the wingman finding all those shots. But Watt is following up to get that dirty. Legacy is not trying to overextend. Still staying on this lip of a hill. It can get eliminated in your fees. They see the squads over on the other side of the house. It's Moist that's also putting in some pressure as well. Rather, it's P.O.P. on the high ground. Moist just playing off that low ground. It looks like it's just Gil down there. But Lux40 also sharing some of that space right in front of P.O.P. It's about their next move. Last member of the meat squadron is likely going to have to face off against PLP and Legacy combined, if not both at the same time. PLP are looking very comfortable with the shields, the evac tower that we know they have, plenty of ammunition, and now an ult excel to get Zainu, the rolling thunder, make a push onto the high ground, actually possible to take the fight up against Legacy. Meat lovers do go down. Legacy hanging on to height for now, and even with a 1x, now Azul is making the 30-30 diff real. And the wingman too, by the way. It's been crazy. So many squads going down. Moist get eliminated. Meat lovers met, met their demise. PLP, though, yeah, trying to fight onto Legacy. Azul with these wingman shots has been going crazy. Coming in clutch, taking out the first place squad. Goes for the quick shield swap. No! And the last member of that team goes down. Exit get eliminated in the feed. Man, so plays like he's immortal in that fight, swinging through a cat wall, essentially blind, and then actually getting the status applied to him. On the other end of this ring, we've been talking up complexity. Now can they survive the gauntlet? A quick reset does give them time, but it's Dark Zero on the other side, and Dark Zero are not going to give this up. Jen Burton oh. fries Monsoon alive with the help of Sykes, and it's one member left of complexity. One member that is sure to go down. Four teams are left, and it's Dark Zero 
that take over all of Complexity's hard work. Sykes coming in with the Prowler. Thank you very much as Complexity with that early rotate was the cause of their demise. We knew that so many teams were going to look to collapse on them and Dark Zero had them in their sights for a long time. But giving up that building and that lot, look who moved up. It is Disguise. This is their time to shine. This circle pulling towards their respective POI and now having the space to play right behind Furia avoids them to get pinched between both of these teams. Quick oh. flyover. This oh. is what we talked about earlier. Oobs possible, and in this case, sort of forced from Jaguares. Nezul and Yanya leave Jaguares to deal with his own cat wall. This is an ult expended to try and get back over to the team, but no additional conduit cooldowns in order to help and a bunch of nades now raining in forces a defensive ult out of nazul as well well fury around the corner this is a doomed landing this is not recoverable for as much damage as they were able to do furia still get the kills with the openers that they had and now reset off of a cat wall again forced and again a tough cooldown to let go of well, we're taking that fight right in front of Dark Zero's face. They were able to get that knock just as quickly, even though we saw them get knocked to on the other side from that conduit ult. But it was only one member of Fury before they were able to get that reset. The Skies are not going to be exiting out of this POI either. They're just going to be standing on top of this building while taking a look at Dark Zero, which is probably their biggest threat right now since they have them in their line of sight. Dark Zero started this game in third place. If they play this right, they could rocket up the leaderboards and take a second match day win. That would change everything. And with so much on the line, we can only hear it from them. Let's jump into a listen in with Dark Zero. Yeah. Oh, Jen, did you? No, yeah, I do, I do. Yeah, we just fucked them, bro. I just can smoke you and run around in it, really. I can't even wall left the team. I can kind of zone out mine, but... <laughs> they're, only front, they're not really safe. They're not even safe right now. I'm going to try to keep extra them. I'm not going to peek with you. Uh, okay, I don't know if it's worth it. How soon can just beat me on the fucking cross? Careful, careful. No, you, you have to angle the rock to stay safe from house. You have to angle uh, the rock okay, to stay safe from house. Left. You're yeah. listening to me? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Let me get listen. here later. We can't let them wrap left. I think Jen, Jen stays there. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to watch the left team. Not they're not going. They're not nice. there. I'm going to try pressure. I might wall them. I think they're walling on them. Are oh, they looking for full? I'm letting them full. One to the roof. Letting the full. I'm on rock right now. They're just hot staring at me. Watch out! Oh, we got a bad off. He's one shot. I'm coming back. I got bang out to it. I got bang out to it. I'm chilling. I'm not safe. No one's safe, I think. No one's safe. No one's safe. I have to tank it. Are you monkey us? Manning, manning, manning. I don't manning. see them. I don't see them. Manning, manning. Tell him. I think we're okay. I have no smokes. They're okay, enough. They got wall back. They're fighting us, fighting us. Okay, okay, okay. Come down, come down. I wall, I wall, I wall. Give me up, give me up, give me up, give me up. A banning, banning. I can't go to him. They have to go left. They have to go left on my condo. Keep going, guys. Keep going, guys. Yeah, they're going. 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 Dark Zero after getting walled on are on the verge of losing control. Zero is getting back into the game. It's a gold knockdown that changes the fight for Dark Zero. With plenty of clutter still being thrown at them, there is no good place to be. Arc stars abound. Dark Zero with just two members left still have another team to oh deal with. And guess who it is? It's Disguised that come up. It's Disguised that take the win in Thermal Station. Coming back from the depths of the leaderboard. They finally come in. I saw Design tossing out that arc star, cleaning up a double at the very end. The patience comes in, but Dark Zero knew. You heard through those comms. They knew the moment that catwalk came up, Furia was taking the fight to them. Furia, we talked about it earlier, they don't play for the dub. They play for the KP. Yes, placement points are incredibly important, but this is a team that loves to fight, and they grief Dark Zero's opportunity to try to take any sort of space away from Disguise, allowing Disguise to just walk in and clean up what was left of that fight. And man, what a way to do it as well. Here we were before game six with me asking questions about what Disguised would look like in future weeks, whether they could pull back the vibes. Well, with a win in the final game, I'm sure that will help. The rest of their games may not have gone as planned, but to be able to pull things back, and as we said, when the zone pulls to your POI, that's when the pressure is really on you to perform. To do it then should mean so much to all of the players at Disguised, and it is a really nice way for them to end the day. Vicky, I can't help but say, very happy for them.
Me too, because if the comms were, were a bit mixed up there, maybe trying to figure out where you could be on the same page as well, Dia. The Skies definitely have the potential. We've seen them do it. They could definitely do it again, and they did it in that final game, waiting patiently. Even if they weren't able to get to that god spot originally, they still were able to ease their way in without any other teams coming in from the back. Yeah, this, this honestly looked really good, and a big part of that was the high ground that DSG had. Dark Zero were the better push for Furia just because they weren't sitting on a roof. Let's take a look back at this game because there was a lot more to this than the end zone. A lot of teams played this quite well. Legacy, of course, sitting on the edge, taking our advice from earlier in the game, going for the kills, putting up as many points as they possibly could through specifically taking other teams down. FaZe fell at their hands, but it was all on this journey up towards Thermal, where many squads had chosen to wait early. Teams like Sentinels that rotated in, teams like Complexity that set themselves up, and even those that opted for the fight over staging, which was really entertaining in its own right. Even at the end of this fight too, when we saw this 1v1, it was Tech playing incredibly patiently because it was a PK right there on the other side with the disruptors i mean i wouldn't want to take that fight in close quarters too but even moist dropping down giving up that high ground position which also caused their demise but these popping off with the wingman must have been my highlight he was cleaning up everybody on this side of the circle you know what sort of content we need is the Nizul versus Sweet 1v1s with the wingman. <laughs> that that I would like to see because the way that they have played in back-to-back -back days, first on Saturday with Sweet, now on Sunday with Nizul, are both game-changing performances. And even though Legacy do not win this game, the kills that they were able to collect upon this zone close and the placement they got alongside it rockets them up the leaderboard after a very difficult storm point. And what an amazing end circle we got to witness too. From Legacy, unfortunately, getting clipped by the hill and then getting separated and putting them in a vulnerable position. Furia capitalized and then completely collapsed on Dark Zero. Look at the freedom enemy has on the rooftop. Just taking free shots at all the other teams right through the cat wall. You don't have to see where those other players are. And this was the opportunity for Disguise to take the win with all the nades that they were able to toss right there onto the cat wall. Dark Zero fought valiantly at the end, but Disguised knew exactly what was happening. It's hard to avoid focus when we get that late into the game. 12 kills at the end of it all and a 24 point game for Disguised. Huge year, very necessary too for this team. It has been a very lackluster throughout the rest of the day until the very end where it mattered. Dark Zero following up behind, coming in second place with 3KP Furia. It's almost like the top three teams that T and I had highlighted coming out on the <laughs> top three here for this final game. Even Legacy, complexity though, still staying as consistent as they could with PLP falling in that 10th place spot. And seriously, big, big love to Legacy for this game. What a great turnaround. I do want to look further down the leaderboards. It's like you say, PLP is the cutoff, and right below them, Meat Lovers, who, while they have not been a focus of today, didn't quite put up the performance that they had in yesterday's games. And we've got to look at them seriously over the next couple, for while they did have some good 3v3s, didn't have the same sort of stylish flair as they did in yesterday's lobbies. Optic also a notable attendant of the bottom 10 for this particular game really nice to see all these thoughts so even phase though phase not having the best day today optic gaming sentinels had a fantastic time on storm point but unfortunately fell off going into world's edge not finding that footing that we were expecting them to find here even moist though coming in with 7kp but it was in the middle of those rotations that they fell behind you yeah this was honestly a difficult one for, for for FaZe versus was this something that FaZe did poorly, especially in the last game? Was this something that Legacy did well? And that seems to be the constant tug of war rain day with so many teams in the lobby. When is it something that you could have done better versus something that we can praise another team for? You know, that's kind of where the consistency of a league starts to show itself. When you have teams that you know know better and you have teams in a stage now where some some of them do know better and, and maybe we would put TSM or, or even Dark Zero, even though they're adding in Sykes with the core they have, they would know better. But when you look at teams that maybe are coming together after 
a, a big change, you know, like Phony and Frex and adding in Zainu and trying to, uh, you know, try, or just trying to find their rhythm, right? When you see, um, not Zainu, excuse me, but when you see like that, that that's PLP, but when you see the dynamic of with FaZe, you know, trying to bring Zeratrick and Panders and Snipe together, uh, how will they work together? We don't know yet. That That's kind of where you go, that maybe it's experience, maybe in a few weeks it won't be and they should have done it differently but still as we come uh, to an end here for this first round of round robins let's take a look at our final three games and our final circles because these were the teams that at the end of the day showed up big and that's certainly what matters how you start is important but as you'll see as we kind of end the broadcast in the next few and also look towards the future of what the middle of the season starts to look like it is about how you end it and it's always about how you end at land. It's always about how you end when it's match point in the ALGS. And so now we're seeing who is showing up in the late stages of the game. And this one was a great start to it. Complexity had been owning this Loba pick. Kim Chi Lee coming in. Monsoon had mentioned specifically that this squad just did not have enough time. Lou and Monsoon and, and Kim Chi Lee to really work together before the split started. But once the split started, they had the experience. They put in the hours each week. And you can see it has shown market improvement and made them continue to make smart decisions. They've always been able to do that. They've always been able to aim well. And now it's finally coming together as they take down Optic in this one and they make it simple to go out and grab themselves a victory. Game four started off well for them. They would slink back a little bit, Vicky, but game five, it would be another team that would kind of take the story. It was PLP coming out on top, and I love how you highlighted Complexity before because it was basically a night and day difference compared to what their performance was for day number one. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't in that top five spot that we were seeing them in before. Nine lives were looking to restabilize here in this end circle, and I know D and I lost our minds seeing the follow up that PLP performed onto Complexity. I have never seen a squad get deleted so quick ever, and Complexity here, we're just seeing all the squads funneling out of that house into their lovely open arms and plp saw them like bait at the same time they threw out the creeping garage they were able to get in the follow-ups with some thermites and then the r9 follow-up as well from plp allowed them to finish off this fight just as quickly as it started Whew. yeah i mean just amazing stuff from plp dia they would close this one out and you could say wow this team maybe has just cemented themselves at winning over the day they'd end up with seven more points with 71. not quite sure if it's enough we'll see i think i have a hankering but this last game it showed disguise finally having a wake-up call and it was cool that this was the way that it ended as well because with with plp taking the last match maps victory zero was poised to also demonstrate his prowess as an igl to take the team to victory once again but they fell victim to what everyone falls victim to in the apex legends global series and that is sometimes just being the best option dark zero may not have been the team to push it certainly did not win fury of the game but it was their best shot at winning both IGLs recognizing that Dark Zero fought valiantly, but could not then withstand the third party. Another natural part of Apex Legends. And Dark Zero, as good as they are, and as great as Zero is to get into the final zone, there's just sometimes nothing you can do when Furia decides to push you. You know that, even lands have experienced that. Uh, they've got $300,000, at least as Watson does, in terms of prize money as a result of that at one of our lands. And I think at the end of the day, that's where you just have to be in a better spot. No one wanted to go and contest on the building because it was not a fair fight. That's why Disguised getting there actually did put them in that god spot in control of the lobby. And what would it mean? It would mean PLP would stay your number one team. No crazy shenanigans from Dark Zero. Complexity with an amazing second place over DZ Furia because of that fight, maybe pushing in the right way. I'm not sure. I don't know if they got second in this last one. I'd have to look back, but it's a two point difference between them and Sentinel. So whatever they did to get there, that was the leapfrog to get in the fourth. And obviously X at Moist Elevate Disguise. That's maybe the biggest one, Vicky. Disguise literally jumped from back half of our back 20 all the way into ninth, the better performance than they had last week. And it's crazy because we were talking about it before we jumped into that last game about how top heavy this overall lobby looked, including that middle pack and whichever of these teams had that one great game would elevate them in the overall standings for this lobby. And it's also nice to know PLP, I, I highlighted complexity. I mean, in day number one, they finished the day in 16th. So you talk about teams that iron things out that they got to do better. PLP and complexity are the perfect examples of that.
for even more on Disguised, I can't emphasize how important today was for them because it takes them from 20th, that is awarded zero overall league points, to 9th, that's awarded 11. Yeah. That is such a massive difference, and it alone is responsible for putting them in the top 10 now overall. I mean, top 10 is incredible. I mean, that's where you want to be heading into this. And also, I mean, this guy must know his Apex Raven. One of the things he mentioned was not only do they have to get the comms right, he said, this is a team I like watching because they can drop a 20 bomb at any time. They're always, <laughs> always impactful. Well, they got a 20 bomb in terms of points, and that's put them in the top 10. The back half, though, with DZ, LG, and TSM still leading out in front, tells a different story. And this story is interesting because when you go to the that bottom 10 through 20 teams, You've kind of had the end of our cycle of, okay, this is the last of the beginning. Now we're kind of getting into the middle of the split. And if you look truly ahead, you start to look at, well, a new season is coming into Apex. What does that mean? It's season 20, we don't have any information on that, but there might be a few weeks that teams are getting used to it. So in many ways, this is now the rush to take advantage of all the work that you've done leading up to this meta. In case the meta shifts, you don't know if that's gonna benefit you positively or negatively yet, Vicky. Yeah, that's such a good point. I'm really happy you brought that up. And you look at teams that could at least stay consistently on top. Dark Zero staying in third for today. We saw the gauntlet that they ran in that first day where they finished with 90 points. Now allowing them to sit in the overall standings at the very top. Looking at this bottle, bottom half though, Cream Oversleepers, Temper, teams that a lot of eyes were on them after they you know, showed some promising performances, unfortunately falling flat. I can't wait to see what that new season is gonna provide though, because what Rain Day mentioned is incredibly important. Important. What can change in Apex Legends where the meta could immediately shift away from the teams that have been able to find that consistency? Yeah, and you know, I uh, want to just correct myself. I had said DSG's performance better today. Obviously, they played yesterday, and the 15 was not their placement. That was actually the points they earned that came in fifth. So DSG obviously bouncing back uh, a little bit farther than they wanted to, but that slip wasn't big enough towards uh, their capture of points at the end. So just wanted to clarify that. The other thing to clarify is who gets the MVP today? Because I have to say, it was a toss up between a lot of good performances. We had Dark Zero coming up, we had Complexity Flame, but you knew it had to be on our winning squad here, PLP, and it's none other than Zainu. What a performance from the young lad. 8,000 damage, 10 kills, nine assists, even across the board in terms of impact. And he's playing with Jen Burton. He's, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going, I'm, I'm mixing Sykes. I'm mixing every controller player up. I never should have done that four player thing. I'm saying Sykes <laughs> is playing with Frex and Phony, who are guys who have played together with FaZe and Snipe Down, but bringing in this new squad together on PLP, they don't know what the fit is going to be. Having come from Dark Zero and Jen Burton and Zero and not found that right fit after champs, zainu has been able to, with PLP, craft a new identity, yet still be the same dominant player that we saw he had the potential to be when he was with Dark Zero last split. And that's a big deal, obviously, uh, for Phony and squad to be able to do that. And 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 I think, Vicky, if you look at Zainu's I knew fitting in so seamlessly. Phony and Frex got to be very, very happy with just the synergy so far that this swap has given their team. Each individual player on PLP are incredibly strong. You think about Zainu and his history on Dark Zero, like you mentioned, alongside Frex and Phony, I knew that this team was going to have a great performance. Just a little rusty for day number one, but at least being able to pop off after ironing out what you had to. And uh, I know that we love talking winners. We love talking MVPs. I, I think we have one with us right now, ready for an interview. If I'm not mistaken, it should be the man. He's not wearing a fedora or any of those cool hats that I usually see him wearing when I see him in the street, styling out, you know, before he's getting married, doing all these great things. It's phony, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm going good, boss. How about you? I'm doing great, man. Congratulations on uh, the win today. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm going to just leave it up to you. I want to know, how are you feeling taking the W? It's a contested lobby. I kind of hit a little bit on on Zainu and his performance, but from you and, and, and your perspective with Frex and, and this new roster, PLP, how does it feel to take the dub here in uh, kind of the last game of a full circle of a round robin here uh, for our first three match days? Um, and honestly, it feels amazing. Because when we first started, we, we knew that we were all good individual players. It just was going to take some time to get used to because Zainu comes from 
a team where he was playing with Dark Zero, where he was literally giving constant comms. Rex, when he played with me and we played with Snipe, we were giving constant comms with each other, bouncing ideas off of each other. So we knew it was going to be hard, but that first week, I honestly just think it was just a fluke. Like, we were just ironing stuff out. LGS is completely different from scrims. And our communication was very poor, but... You know, on the second week, we decided to fix that and figure out our comms, and everything flowed better after that. Well, I have to ask you, Phony. You guys obviously were able to figure something out. We, like you mentioned, you are all very individually talented players. But after your performance for that first day and your performance today, do you want to share a little bit of what you were able to organize better to see if you guys could stay more cohesive and finding the success that you were able to find today? Yeah, uh, first thing, uh, of course, like if you watch all of our VODs, if you look at Reddit, our communication was very poor. We were all calming everything that we were doing, every micro action, everything, and it just caused our fights to be very sloppy and not coordinated. Of course, our team chemistry, we're still getting together because Zainu is just a hard fragger and all of our paces are somewhat uh, different, but we're, we're getting the tempo down. We're figuring stuff out. We've been bot reviewing with each other. We've been practicing with each other, and it's just going to take some time, but, you know, with time, you know, we'll definitely grow and we'll be better players. Now, I remember talking to you at the beginning of last season and speaking about how on phase you were basically changing how you interacted with your team as an IGL in order to enable your players. It's one of the things that separates you from a lot of IGLs in that way. And I want to know, how are you shifting the way that you IGL to enable this specific roster? What are you like changing about the way that you calm, the way that you play in order to bring yourself success? Well, with my previous roster, I didn't take enough risk, and it caused us to like lose on a lot of kills. Uh, most of our rotates consisted of not fighting teams and rotating around them. And with this roster, I'm very confident in fighting things because Zion is just an amazing fragger, and just having Frex there as a support, uh, it's just good to have him on our back, and it allows us to flow fights easier. That's no shade to any any of the guys on the Fate roster or to snipe himself. Like I love that guy, but that's besides the point. Our the, the main problem was just. When it came to fighting, I wasn't necessarily trusting my team as much than when I did with this team. Yeah, trust is a huge part of it. And I think when you look at the history of teams and, and ways that you've competed going back, you know, years now in terms of the ALGS, you have bounced around different squads. Do you feel right now with plp that this is the squad that you can really do some damage in i mean this obviously everyone looks at land you know you look at winning you look at the big trophy you finally feel you got the right fit uh yeah 100 percent. i mean I, I i felt like i had the right fit on the phase roster as well but um you know things just don't go our way sometimes we were we were all hyped to win you know we were we were down to win champs we were we were in first place at one point you know looking to secure it and then we were at match point. We thought we were going to win. We did the same thing with split two. We thought we were going to win, but we ended up, you know, fucking ourselves over. I IGL'd us in a bad way. And it caused us to be fifth and sixth at both lands. And I feel like with this roster, even with the mistakes, like we can still secure something. Like our mentals are just like checked for the next, for the next game. Like we're ready to go for the next game. I uh, I think that uh, I, I think I saw Gia might have had a question for you, but I'm going to close this one out. I mean, sometimes just to comment on that, sometimes it is a matter of just having the experience, having the communication, like you mentioned, which is similar from all three of you. And it's not a matter of necessarily who's better. We've been actually talking about that. There's a lot of players that swap that play almost the same role, the same input. Um, and then sometimes it just works or it doesn't in terms of results. And there's there's these things that are intangibles. And, you know, it seems like phony, whatever, it was today if you guys keep doing that um it's going to be very tangible plp is looking like a threatening roster here to kick off the season and congrats again on a major win yeah thank you again thank you guys again for all your support um like i said we were just ironing stuff out of course we didn't stream to the fans i know the fans really wanted to see us uh the ones that really support us and the ones that are just not there just to bounce off of other teams and just start negativity but uh, yeah, huge support to you guys. We'll look to stream, of course, in the future and actually stream ourselves and see what we're capable of. We just wanted to iron stuff out and, you know, focus solely on our performance and not just focus on, you know, building our brand at the same time. So. Awesome, man. Well, congratulations again. PLP taking the win, talking to their IGL. Phony, go get some rest, man, or celebrate whichever you decide. I don't know. You know, you can go either way here. You can go to bed or you can go out. I'm not sure, but Phony definitely happy with the results. Vicky's a, you know, obviously a great guy to talk to and, and always oh, yeah. a pleasure to have on the cast.
He's also a great personality in the scene. Very positive individual. I've gotten to meet him a, a few times already in person during LAN, and he usually tries to stay positive no matter what the results of the day is. And that's what you need a lot in your team, especially when you have such heavy fraggers making up a full squad. As long as your mental is in the right state, I like how Phony was able to explain what they needed to do and stay focused. And if that, you know, is at the cost of him streaming his point of view, then it takes whatever you have to do so that way you could at least stay on top in the pro league. Absolutely, Vicky. Wise words. So great to have you on the broadcast. Dia, as well, before we let you finish off on a great day, any final thoughts uh, just either reacting to Phony or about the Apex that we saw transpire? For, well, I mean, for Phony, great hair. Love the new look from Phony. He was hiding but... it in the hats all the time. What's yeah, going on? Now we get to see, I don't even know what to call it, the hairstyle, but I like it. I will not I will not emulate it. I can't, <laughs> I can't dye my hair. I'm too scared. I have, however, really enjoyed this weekend of Apex Legends, and we've been talking about it all day, but with the end of the first round, Robin, we've now set the stage for this split of Apex Legends, and that is so wonderful. Your best teams in North America, as much as things change, as much as we're in the new season, things have stayed the same. Our Dark Zero, LG, and TSM, who would have thought? Currently <laughs> leading the pack. So I do look forward to how that'll change in the weeks to come and how many more land contenders we can get before the season is out that is right great great close there man i appreciate both of you congrats again on a great cast great day you too go get some rest as well let's finish this thing over here on the main channel guys what a time it is to be an apex fan now for the rare versions of you who get excited and want to play apex but you don't just open up apex you say i want to compete in apex i actually have an answer for you it is the challenger circuit registration closes january 31st for our upcoming feb 3 to 5th challenger circuit there's another one opening up february 5th but if you really are inspired do something a little hey maybe you wouldn't have thought to do it maybe now's the time every one of these players wasn't a pro till they did something like this or they tried Okay, thank you very much. Maybe not Snipe Down. He's been a pro for like 20 years in different games, but you know, we're not including all players here. Next Sunday, though, I gotta say, we got a huge match day coming for you. It is gonna be fun. We have got teams out the wazoo that are gonna be performing, hitting expectations. Could it be 07? We saw Max Drafey and you aim uh, take a good point total there. I think right above 07. Can they get it back as they begin their second of three round robins here in our ALGS split one? Nasky, Amphi, and Nags putting it together. Absolutely dominant early on. It's looking like a great sign for them to do some damage at land, but first they've got to get there. And Oh man, I'm getting hungry. Why? Oh, it's a full English. They're around two. You got to say the logo inspires confidence or hunger, maybe a little bit of both. Bryn, Sardell, noises, go back at it. And it's funny because we are talking about Nasky. We're talking about Max Trafee. Now we're talking about Dell. They've split, but they've done great things on their own. And if you're maybe just paying attention to North America, well, it's time to see the number one squad in north america go back at it it's funk it's slayer it's lg sweet that's right the g still remains only one letter before this time around guys what a time i know that you want to stay in touch with all that we're doing here's an easy way to do it play apex esports on twitter and play apex esports on youtube or twitch.tv slash play apex that will keep you in touch with all of our broadcasts it has been a long day it's been a long weekend two back-to-backs we have today covered 40 different teams 120 different players from around the world and there's still more broadcasts happening so everyone who made that happen from the players the staff production the crew behind the scenes ea and all of my talent team as well. We thank you. We appreciate you. We invite you to never give up, never stop gaming, uh -huh. and we will see you next week. I've been outspoken since I was young, never could find the muscle that fit. Now I'm old to carry you on, whether the storm giving them fit. Uh -huh. I'm legit, walking my own trail, this my own tail, never go stale, got them going bail, why they so scared? I got no guess in the world. Wait for that hand seat. Make it just take me to ready. ready. I came ready to party. party. Bring the bag of confetti. Hey. Wish I could stop the talk and take the pause. Only to breathe the free of the tea. Stay in the chase until you fucking believe. Huge empire shots. No third one. Why you fucking a crime? This is the turn. Stay out of line. Start to make him a wine. Don't stop till you speak your mind. Hope for more than action. Say it with passion. Don't need to ask him. I will take the harassment. Don't stop till you speak your mind. Hey!
Let's go. When I'm in silence, you can accept this, sir. 